dawn on a summer's day, 1943. The first rays of sunlight revealed a column of grey vehicles and men crossing a bridge over the Dnieper River. They were moving west. The column of some vehicles kept on coming day after day, night after night. From behind them came the sporadic sound of gunfire. Each burst caused the retreating Germans to cast anxious glances over their shoulders. But then they heard a new sound. The soldiers began to run and push their comrades aside. It was the squeal of tank tracks and the familiar roar of T-34 engines. The tanks approached the bridge at full speed. Then there was a deafening explosion. German demolition charges had collapsed three sections of the Kanyev Bridge. With them went the Soviet High Command's last chance of getting tanks quickly across the Dnieper. Soviet infantry had crossed the river at several points, but without tank support, the Germans were able to contain the small bridgeheads. After the German defeat at Kursk in August 1943, the front line began to race westwards. The Red Army advanced in overwhelming strength, with more than 2.6 million men and 2,400 tanks. The German High Command planned to make its stand at the Dnieper River. The army was ordered to dig in on its western bank to form the so-called Wotan Line. To slow the Soviet advance, von Manstein's army group began a scorched earth policy. Anything that could not be carried away was burnt or blown up. It was nothing less than the systematic destruction of eastern Ukraine. This was one of the climactic horrors in a country where the war claimed more than five million civilian lives, one in eight of the population. As the Germans retreated westwards, they destroyed all the bridges and tore up the railway lines. The advance across this devastated landscape put a huge strain on Red Army logistics. Fuel and ammunition had to be delivered by truck over hundreds of miles. Heavy artillery and bridging equipment struggled to keep up. North of Kiev, Andrei Kravchenko's 5th Guards Tank Corps became one of the first units to reach the Dnieper. Andrei Grigorovich Kravchenko was an experienced tank general whose brigade had played a key part in the Battle of Moscow in 1941. The following year, he commanded a tank corps at the Battle of Stalingrad, after which his unit was renamed the Stalingrad Guards Tank Corps. In 1943, he fought at the famous tank battle at Prokhorovka, part of the Kursk offensive. Kravchenko was rather heavily built for a tank soldier. 
In fact, he was so large that when he sat in the commander's seat, it was impossible to close the hatch. The wide Diesna River did not stop the tanks of Kravchenko's 5th Guards tank corps. Without waiting for the bridging units, his men made their tanks watertight and drove across. But the Dnieper was too deep to be crossed in this fashion. Only the infantry, using rafts and floats, were able to get across. They established small footholds on the far bank of the river. South of Kiev, an extraordinary attempt was made to get the 40th and 3rd Guards tank armies across the river. The Dnieper here was about 600 metres wide. Almost a 1,000 piles were used to build a temporary bridge able to bear the weight of a tank. The engineers worked under German artillery fire and aerial bombing. But after 10 days, the bridge was ready. T-34s from the 3rd Guards tank army began to roll across the Dnieper. Meanwhile, the Germans had been busy strengthening their defences. The Ukrainian capital, Kiev, lay on the far side of the river and would be almost impossible to capture by frontal assault. Therefore, General Vatutin, commanding the Voronezh front, decided on two flanking attacks from his bridgeheads across the river. Throughout October, Vatutin's troops struggled to fight their way out of the bridgeheads. As winter came, it seemed the front line itself had frozen solid. So Vatutin decided to change the plan. He would target just one bridgehead and use all his armoured formations to smash his way out. About 40,000 soldiers of the 3rd Guards tank army and hundreds of tanks moved north under cover of darkness. On the morning of the 5th of November, the Red Army attacked, immediately cutting the highway between Kiev and Zhitomir. The Germans' only escape route was blocked. Soon, the first T-34s were in Kiev, entering by the twisting road that runs through the ravines of the Nivki district. Today, this street is still called Tank Street. In the city itself, Burning buildings, tracer rounds and flares turned night into day. The Red Army tank crews smashed their way into downtown Kiev. The surviving Germans made a hasty exit. By dawn, the city was clear. General Kravchenko's 4th Stalingrad Guards Tank Corps could add another battle honour to their standard, Kiev. The Red Army liberated Kiev just one day before the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution on the 7th of November. There were rumours that Stalin had given Vatutin a clear order. Take Kiev by the anniversary of the revolution at any cost. But this was probably not true. Otherwise, Vatutin would have sent his tank straight into Kiev. But instead, he'd chosen to first cut off the German escape route by encircling the city from the west. That winter, 
Ukraine was to be the scene of ferocious fighting. The vast open steppe, once frozen hard, was ideal terrain for tanks. Both sides poured in their armoured reserves. The Red Army's 6th Tank Army, the last to be created in the war, was formed in January 1944. It was to be led by the liberator of Kiev, General Andrei Kravchenko. His new army received its baptism of fire within days. By the beginning of 1944, the Red Army had advanced as far as Zhitomir and Kirovograd. But the Germans still held a bulge stretching east around the city of Kanyev. Hitler, with total disregard for the facts, believed this could form a launch pad for a future German counteroffensive. The Soviet High Command had its own plans for this bulge. The Korsen Shevchenkovsky offensive began on the 24th of January 1944. The attack was led by the second Ukrainian front. Two days later, the first Ukrainian front joined in on the opposite flank. The attack was led by the 245 tanks and self-propelled guns of Kravchenko's 6th Tank Army. Self-propelled guns, or SPGs, were heavy guns mounted on the chassis of a tank or some other vehicle. They were a mobile form of artillery used to provide fire support to infantry and tanks. Heavy versions, like the Soviet Su-152, were also effective at knocking out German heavy tanks like the Tiger. In just five days, Kravchenko's tanks had linked up with Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army near the village of Sveni Gorodka. Almost 60,000 Germans had been encircled. The trapped forces became known as Group Stemmermann, after the general commanding them. Two Soviet tank armies now turned south, prepared to repel any German rescue attempt. The encircled Germans fought on, in the firm belief that help would arrive. But all remembered the fate of Paulus's 6th Army at Stalingrad the previous winter. General Konyev, commanding the 2nd Ukrainian Front, had promised Stalin just such another victory. But Hitler was equally adamant that no such thing would occur. He told the encircled men, you can rely on me as on a stone wall, but for the present, stand firm and shoot as long as you have ammunition. General Huber, commanding 1st Panzer Army, radioed to Stemmermann simply, I shall release you, Huber. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe was able to resupply Group Stemmermann by air. Relying on air resupply had been disastrous during the Battle of Stalingrad. The Luftwaffe had not been able to get in enough supplies for 300,000 men, but Group Stemmermann was a fifth of that size. Meanwhile, von Manstein was assembling armoured units to make a rescue attempt. He turned to the 3rd and 47th Panzer Corps, commanded by Generals Niklaus von Vormann and Hermann Breit. Hermann Breit was a highly experienced 51-year-old Panzer general. He was a veteran of the campaigns in Poland and France and had served with the Army General Staff during the invasion of the Soviet Union. He then commanded a Panzer division before leading 3rd Panzer Corps during the Battle of Kursk. The Soviets came under attack from four German panzer divisions. Reinforced by 80 Tigers and Panthers of the heavy panzer regiment Becker. In February 1944, the Red Army's main tank was still the T-34 armed with a 76mm gun. It was no match for these German heavy tanks. 
The Germans captured the village of Lysianka, but they were still a few miles short of breaking through to Group Stemmermann. And now Red Army reinforcements arrived, General Bogdanov's second tank army. Both sides found it extremely difficult to maneuver. If previous winters had been unusually severe, this winter was remarkably mild. Already the thaw had turned roads into rivers of mud. The battle of the Corson Chakasi pocket had become a decisive phase of the winter campaign. And it was here that a fearsome new Soviet tank made its first appearance the Yosef Stalin. The Yosef Stalin, or East II tank, was developed as a direct response to the German Tiger. Its front armor was 120 mm thick, comparable to a Tiger. And although less accurate and with a slower rate of fire, its powerful 122 mm gun was a serious threat to the German heavy tanks. The East II tanks were grouped into independent heavy tank regiments and assigned to crucial sectors of the front where a breakthrough was required. They were particularly effective at storming German towns and cities in 1945. Versions of the East II tank were still in service with the Russian army as late as 1995. The first combat between East Twos and Tigers and Panthers ended in stalemate. The Germans held on to their gains but could advance no further. Group Stemmermann was bombarded with leaflets urging them to surrender. General Seidlitz Kurzbach, who'd been captured at Stalingrad, appealed to them by loudspeaker. He was now a committed anti Nazi. A Soviet envoy was dispatched with proposed terms of surrender, but he was sent back. Group Stemmermann knew it was now up to them to fight their way out of the pocket. Fighting desperately, they got as far as Shenderovka, just five kilometers short of 3rd Panzer Corps. A furious Stalin telegraphed Zhukov. The reason for the enemy's breakthrough was that the weak 27th Army was not reinforced in a timely manner claimed Stalin. Rotmistrov's tank army was hurriedly redeployed to ensure there was no breakout. A February frost had frozen the ground hard, restoring momentum to operations. Breit was able to renew his advance on Shenderovka. At the forefront of the fighting was the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking, recruited largely from Scandinavian volunteers. But one by one, its vehicles were knocked out. Fuel resupply by air was erratic and often interrupted by bad weather. Field Marshal von Manstein, commander of Army Group South, well remembered the Stalingrad disaster. There had been no attempt by the encircled troops to fight their way out. This time, without consulting Hitler, he gave Stemmermann clear orders. Group Stemmermann must make the breakthrough itself to the line Zerzhentsi, Hill 239. There, it will link up with the 3rd Panzer Corps. The encircled divisions prepared for the last stage of their breakout. On the evening of the 16th of February, they destroyed heavy equipment and supplies, and at dusk began their advance. The Belgian Nazi Leon de Grel, who commanded the 5th SS Volunteer Sturm Brigade Wallonian, described the scene. At 2200, the Soviet batteries shelled the center of the village. The burning houses lit up the retreating troops as if it were daytime. This made it easier for the Soviet artillery spotters to do their job. The shells fell onto our huge column. To survive, we had to drop into the snow every second. That night, several units slipped through the lines to the 3rd Panzer Corps. The next day, Soviet attack aircraft were grounded by bad weather. 
but most units had still not reached safety. Even worse, they found their rendezvous at Hill 239 was still in Soviet hands and heavily defended by T-34s. The Germans were forced to bypass Hill 239, but this put the Niloy Tikic River between them and the safety of their own lines. 20,000 men were trapped on the wrong side of a fast-flowing river. It was 30 metres wide, freezing cold, and there were no bridges. T-34s were approaching from the north. Desperate to escape, some men improvised rafts and lifelines to get across. But many panicked and hurled themselves into the icy water. Hundreds were drowned. Many succumbed to shock or hypothermia. In all, about half of Group Stemmermann managed to escape. But there had been 30,000 German casualties. Amongst them, General Stemmermann himself killed commanding the rear guard. It could have been much worse for the Germans. The Stalingrad on the Dnieper that Konyev had promised had failed to materialize. But it was still a heavy defeat for the Wehrmacht. Step by step, river by river, the Red Army was forcing the invader back. The battle of the korsun cherkasy pocket was only a prologue to Soviet success in Ukraine. The heavy losses sustained there by German panzer divisions meant Army Group South could no longer mount effective counterattacks. As the battle raged around the pocket, the first Ukrainian front was fighting its way westwards to liberate the cities of Rovno and Lutsk. Instead of tanks, General Vatutin was able to exploit his success with old-fashioned cavalry. As they swept forwards through the villages of Ukraine, another salient was formed, hanging over German Army Group South. The Soviet High Command moved two tank armies into this salient, intending to launch them southwards against the rear of General Huber's 1st Panzer Army. The offensive began on the 22nd of March, 1944. Three days later, 200,000 men of 1st Panzer Army were encircled. This new German pocket was centered on the city of Kamenetz Podolsky. Hitler ordered the 2nd SS Panzer Corps to be sent from France to rescue Huber's Panzer Army. With the help of these reinforcements and Huber's skillful handling of his troops, the 1st Panzer Army fought its way out of the trap. But most of their vehicles and heavy equipment had to be left behind. The rampant success of the Red Army in Ukraine had dramatic strategic implications. One was that the German High Command became convinced that the great Soviet summer offensive of 1944 would be launched in Ukraine. So it was here that they rushed their tank and aircraft reserves. But the Red Army's summer offensive, codenamed Operation Bagration, will be launched in Belarus. It resulted in the liberation of Minsk and the annihilation of German Army Group Center. German panzer reserves had to be rushed north to shore up the line.
the two remaining German panzer divisions in Ukraine were moved to the rear and put under General Breit's command. They were to be held back to counterattack any Soviet offensive. On the 14th of July, 1944, the first Ukrainian front attacked towards the city of Lvov. Breit's armored reserve moved forward to counterattack. But the Soviets now also controlled the air. On the march, wrote General von Melentin, the 8th Panzer Division, moving in long columns, was attacked by Russian aviation. It sustained great losses. Many tanks and trucks were burned. All hopes of a counterattack collapsed. The first Ukrainian front's advance led to the encirclement of the German 8th Army Corps near the town of Brody. Amongst its units was the 14th Waffen SS Grenadier Division, Galizia. The 14th SS Division was called in German Galizia, in Ukrainian Galicinia. Its recruits were anti Bolshevik volunteers from Galicia, a historic region of western Ukraine. In July 1944, the division was 15,000 strong. It was commanded by a German, SS Brigadefuhrer Fritz Freitag. In 1943, it had been engaged in anti-partisan operations. In the summer of 1944, it was at the front for the first time. General von Melentin described how the SS Division Galizia, holding positions in the woods, could not hold firm, so the Russians penetrated deeply into the left flank of our corps. There was to be no breakout from the Brody pocket. The survivors surrendered to the Red Army four days after their encirclement. The SS Division Galizia was reformed around the 3,000 men who escaped the catastrophe at Brody. It was later used to fight partisans in Yugoslavia. The division surrendered to the Western Allies in May 1945. Thanks to the influence of the Vatican, which viewed the men of the Galizia Division as good Catholics and devoted anti-communists, its members were able to avoid extradition to the Soviet Union. Instead, many settled in Britain and Canada. Now, Soviet tank armies raised towards Lvov. But the Germans had reorganized their defenses and were able to repel a direct assault on the city. So Soviet forces began to outflank the city from north and south. The news that Soviet tanks had been sighted west of the city caused panic. The Germans abandoned the city. The Red Army crossed the border of the USSR almost unopposed. At the end of July, they captured the Sandomierzi bridgehead across the Vistula River. This would become the launch pad for the final offensive into Germany. The southern flank of the Eastern Front might have become a sideshow if it hadn't been for the vital factor of the Romanian oil fields. They were essential to the German war machine. Hitler would defend this resource at any cost. But he rejected a proposal to retreat to a new line based on the Carpathian Mountains, as suggested by Hitler's ally, the Romanian dictator Ion Antonescu. The only way through the mountains was an 80-kilometer-wide valley, known as the Foxani Gate. Here, Antoniescu was building 1,500 concrete pillboxes. Romania could have been turned into a formidable fortress, but Hitler was utterly inflexible on all questions of retreat. In the summer of 1944, the Romanian front followed the Dniester River, it was held by the German 6th Army. The 6th Army was formed in October 1939. The next year it marched into France and helped to seize the French capital. 
In 1941, it led Army Group South's invasion of Ukraine, but 19 months later, it was destroyed at Stalingrad. The army was reformed the following month under General Hollett. It might have been thought that the number six was unlucky for the Germans. But the army wanted to forget the catastrophe it had suffered at Stalingrad and instead revive the fighting spirit of its first years. This was the army that had marched victoriously through Paris and advanced fearlessly through Ukraine. Now it would defend Romanian oil. Ironically, Sixth Army had the same neighbors as it had at Stalingrad. Its flanks were held by the Romanian Third and Fourth Armies. The Stavka High Command planned another massive encirclement. The Second Ukrainian Front under General Malinovsky and the Third Ukrainian Front under General Tolbukhin were to deliver converging thrusts in order to encircle German troops on the Dniester River. Kravchenko's 6th Tank Army was transferred to the 2nd Ukrainian Front. It had not been in action for several months. It was rested and re-equipped, bristling with more than 400 tanks and self-propelled guns. This was the only Soviet tank army in southeastern Europe. Its role was to make the breakthrough to the Romanian oil fields before leading the advance on Hungary and Austria. Meanwhile, the other Soviet tank armies would lead the advance into Germany. Soviet preparations were made in complete secrecy. The Stavka's main concern was that the enemy would withdraw to the Foxani Gate before the offensive was unleashed. By 1944, the Red Army were masters of camouflage and concealment. The Germans on the Dniester River detected no build-up of Soviet strength. In mid-August, General Freter Pico, commander of the German 6th Army, reported that all was quiet on his front. Little did he realize it was the calm before the storm. The Soviet offensive across the Dniester began on the 20th of August, 1944. One German officer remembered, the divisional headquarters came under heavy Soviet artillery fire. From our vantage point, it seemed the entire Dniester Valley was covered with a dense cloud of smoke. The sun was completely blotted out. Romanian and German units were soon in complete disarray. In particular, they lacked the anti-tank defences to meet this onslaught of Soviet armour. On the third day of fighting, the 6th Army was ordered to retreat. By then, most of its escape routes had already been cut off. And as they withdrew, columns of German troops were strafed and bombed by Soviet aircraft. The 6th Army raced to get back across the River Prut. But as retreating German units approached the town of Hushi, they ran straight into Red Army T-34s, entering town on the other road. The tanks caused carnage amongst the retreating lorries and wagons. The next day, white flares were greeted with cheers from the Red Army soldiers. It meant that the second and third Ukrainian fronts had linked up. The Soviets had encircled the German 6th Army once again. The German and Romanian survivors were falling back to the river Siret. The offensive had been a stunning Soviet success. Meanwhile, the 22-year-old King Michael of Romania summoned Marshal Antoniescu to his palace. 
he asked Antoniescu to take the country out of its alliance with Nazi Germany. When he refused, the king had him arrested. With a guarantee from the USSR that Romanian independence would be respected, Romania joined the Allies. Within days, the Romanian army was fighting the Germans. There were still significant German forces in Romania, particularly guarding the Ploiest oil fields. The Germans used these to try and overturn the Romanian royalist coup, but they were repulsed by the Romanian army. Now, Kravchenko's 6th tank army received orders to advance rapidly on the Foxani gate to deny the enemy any chance to regroup. His tanks raced ahead, passing fortifications abandoned by the Romanian army. Three days later, T-34s reached the Ploiest oil fields. The next day, they reached the Romanian capital, Bucharest. The surviving German forces in Romania had one way out, across the Carpathian Mountains to Hungary. Few units managed to escape. After several unsuccessful attempts to break out of its encirclement, German 6th Army was overwhelmed in September 1944. To defeat Paulus's 6th Army at Stalingrad had taken two months. To defeat Freta Pico's 6th Army in Romania had taken just two weeks. For this brilliant victory, Stalin awarded the 6th Tank Army the coveted title Guards. It was just eight months since the unit had been formed. That autumn of 1944, while operations wound down on the rest of the Eastern Front, the Battle of Hungary roared into life. Here, Hitler was desperate to hang on to his last remaining oil fields. The Soviet advance westwards through the Carpathians was slowed by difficult terrain and bad roads. What's more, Romania used a different railway gauge to the Soviet Union. It meant all supplies arriving by rail had to be transferred onto new wagons. These logistical problems slowed the Red Army's advance more than the enemy. But nevertheless, it rolled steadily onwards towards the Hungarian capital, Budapest. Meanwhile, Hitler had ordered his armoured reserves to Hungary. Amongst them was General Breit's reinforced 3rd Panzer Corps. With the 6th Guards tank army leading the way, the 2nd Ukrainian front was closing in on Budapest. But a direct attack on the city had been ruled out. The Hungarian capital was to be encircled. On the 29th of October 1944, Six Guards Tank Army began its advance along the right bank of the Danube, scattering the German forces in its path. In the south, the third Ukrainian front crossed the Danube and encircled Budapest from the west. The trap closed on Christmas Day 1944. The German reverses near Budapest caused Hitler to reshuffle his commanders. The 6th Army, reformed once again, was placed under the command of General Hermann Balk. Its mission was to lift the siege of Budapest. To achieve this goal, 6th Army was reinforced with two SS Panzer Corps redeployed from Poland. Hitler's chief of staff, Heinz Guderian, objected strongly to weakening the Central Front. But Hitler was adamant. Fierce fighting raged throughout January 1945 as SS Panzer units tried but failed to break the siege. Soviet ultimatums sent to the garrison were rejected. The fighting that followed destroyed most of the city and killed nearly 40,000 civilians. 
the garrison finally surrendered on the 13th of February, 1945. On the 7th of January, Soviet tanks reached the Danube bridges near Komerno, en route to the Hungarian oil refineries. But Hitler, increasingly isolated and delusional, had not given up hope in Hungary. He planned to send in the massed elite panzer formations of the Third Reich, now organized into the 6th SS Panzer Army. After securing his oil supplies, Hitler planned to use the SS Panzer Army to hurl back the Soviets from the gates of Berlin. Soviet forces in Hungary would face the best units still left in the Wehrmacht. But by tying them down in the south, it meant these elite SS formations would not be available for the decisive battle around Berlin. The movement of the SS Panzer Army did not pass unnoticed by Soviet radio intelligence. To counter this threat, the 3rd Ukrainian Front was hurriedly reinforced with Su-100 tank destroyers. These vehicles were specifically designed for taking out German heavy tanks. The 3rd Ukrainian Front received 80 Su-100s. It now had more than any other Soviet front, even those advancing on Berlin. The Su-100 self-propelled gun was a dedicated tank destroyer. It was built on the same chassis as the T-34 tank, but had a forward-facing 100mm gun. This fearsome weapon could penetrate the front armour of a German Panther at 1,500 metres. Mass production only began in September 1944. The last German offensive of World War II was launched at Lake Balaton and stopped by the concentrated fire of Soviet self-propelled guns. With the German assault blunted, Soviet tanks launched their counterattack. The huge numerical advantage of the Red Army meant that it was able to constantly threaten the enemy with encirclement. The SS Panzer Army retreated all the way to Austria, where they prepared a desperate defence of the capital. But on the 13th of April, after several days of fierce street fighting, Vienna fell to the Red Army. But this was not the last battle for the men of the 6th Guards Tank Army. Even as the Soviet victory banner fluttered over the Reichstag in Berlin, Field Marshal Schoerner's Army Group Center fought on in Czechoslovakia. The 6th Guards Tank Army raced on towards Prague. They were joined by tanks of the 1st Ukrainian Front, advancing from the south. The two Soviet fronts met at the Czech capital, encircling Army Group Center and forcing its surrender. In Czechoslovakia, the Red Army captured 900,000 soldiers of the Wehrmacht, including 60 generals. Victory was complete in the south. But in the meantime, a ferocious and desperate battle had been raging in the north. It was the climactic battle of the war, the final objective of the Red Army. The battle for Berlin.
In the middle of the night and under close guard, a new tank regiment arrived at a train station near the border with Belarusia. Alongside the T-34s, some very heavy, bulky objects covered in tarpaulin were unloaded from the flatbed wagons. The Red Army's plans in Belarusia were top secret. These objects would remain a mystery for several days until they were unveiled on the training ground. They were heavy metal rollers, which were to be attached to the front of a T-34. They transformed the tank into a minesweeper. The rollers would detonate any mine in the tank's path, clearing a safe lane for infantry and other vehicles to follow. Two regiments of these engineer tanks had been secretly deployed to the first Belarusian front. Clearly, the front commander, General Rokossovsky, was planning some sort of offensive. But to any onlooker, Soviet forces in Belarusia seemed only to be making defensive preparations. From the air, only movement away from the front lines could be detected. Everything was being done to give the impression that this sector was being weakened and that a Soviet offensive was being prepared somewhere else. On the 6th of June, 1944, the day of the Allied landings in Normandy, Stalin wrote to Churchill, the summer offensive of the Soviet forces, as was agreed at the Tehran conference, will begin in mid-June at one of the vital sectors of the front. Which vital sector was not even to be shared with Allied heads of government? In the east, the Germans were firmly on the defensive in June 1944, as they struggled to fend off the D-Day landings in France. Army Group North was retreating from Leningrad. Army Group South had given up the Crimea and much of Ukraine. Only Army Group Center seemed to be hanging on. German positions on this front formed the so-called Belarusian Balcony. Here, Army Group Center stood firm. Over the winter, it had successfully repulsed two Soviet offensives around Vitebsk and Orsha. Hitler and the German Army High Command had much to consider as summer approached. They had no firm intelligence on when or where the main Soviet offensive would be launched. The Germans decided that Stalin would seek to capitalize on his recent gains in Ukraine. They had brought the Red Army to within striking distance of Romania and its oil fields. So, in the summer of 1944, precious German reserves of tanks and aircraft were sent south. When the Soviet Stavka High Command saw German reinforcements moving to Ukraine, it confirmed their decision to launch a surprise attack in Belarusia. Here, the Red Army would be given the chance to avenge its worst defeat, suffered at German hands in the first months of the war. The operation was codenamed Bagration. The Stavka planned a series of assaults against the flanks of Army Group Center, which would be encircled and destroyed near the cities of Vitebsk and Bobrusk. Then the Red Army would advance on Minsk, cutting off German retreat. The Soviet planned nothing less than the total destruction of German Army Group Center. The Red Army had never set itself such a massive and ambitious goal. General Rokossovsky proposed that his first Belarusian front deliver two simultaneous thrusts against the German right flank at Bobrusk and Slutsk. Each thrust would be given equal priority. This contradicted standard Soviet military doctrine, which dictated that there be a single main axis of advance, with all other attacks acting in a supporting role. Konstantin Konstantinovich Rokossovsky was a decorated hero of the First World War and the Russian Civil War. But probably because of his Polish origin, 
he found himself under arrest in Stalin's Great Purge of 1937. Despite being tortured by the NKVD secret police, he refused to sign a confession or inform on his colleagues. He was released in 1940 and restored to his rank. At the beginning of the war, he commanded a mechanized corps, but rose rapidly to senior command. In May 1944, Rokossovsky was summoned to a meeting of the Stavka to defend his proposal. It was a dramatic scene in which his plan to deliver two simultaneous thrusts came in for much criticism. In his memoirs, Rokossovsky wrote, I was twice sent into the next room to think over the Supreme Command's comments. And each time I came back, I was yet more insistent that I was correct. At last, Stalin said, the front commander's persistence proves that the planning of the offensive has been thoroughly considered. It is a firm guarantee of success. Rokossovsky's proposal had the green light. Vitebsk was held by General Reinhardt's 3rd Panzer Army. But despite its impressive name, by 1944, 3rd Panzer Army had hardly any tanks left. General Reinhardt began the war in command of the 4th Panzer Division, but replaced Hoth as commander of 3rd Panzer Group during the Battle of Moscow in 1941. That year, his tanks had got to within 15 kilometers of the Russian capital. Army Group Center was made up of four armies, with a total strength of about one million men. Operation Bagration was to be the largest and most thoroughly prepared Soviet operation of the war so far. If the Germans had discovered the preparations, they would immediately have reinforced the Biela-Russian front. The forests and swamps presented enough difficulties. German reinforcements would have been disastrous. Therefore, secrecy was of the utmost importance. All troop movements took place only at night, under camouflage, with no lights. White posts were placed at the roadside to keep drivers on the road. Tailgates and bonnets were painted white so they could be seen by other vehicles. Units that hadn't reached their destination by dawn would immediately pull over and begin to camouflage their vehicles. A special pass was needed to drive a vehicle in daytime, and less than a hundred passes had been allocated to each army. Soviet aircraft flew overhead to inspect the troops' camouflage. If a pilot spotted a Red Army unit, he dropped a pennant. This told the unit commander that his men could be seen from the air and that he had to improve his camouflage. Security measures were in place from top to bottom. Plans were drawn up by hand by just two or three officers and taken to the Stavka by the front commander in person. Around Vitebsk, the decision was made not to bring up any tanks for the first phase of the attack. There was too much risk that they would be detected. Red Army radio traffic vanished. Russian units were notorious for bad radio discipline. But as one German noted, the Russians broke with tradition and observed complete radio silence. <laughs> Meanwhile, Soviet soldiers practiced crossing the swamps and forests of Bielorussia. Infantrymen learned how to cross marshes, how to swim, and how to find their bearings in the woods. Many made marsh shoes so they could walk without sinking into the swamps. They built rafts to transport machine guns, mortars and light guns through the marsh. Logs and fascines, bundles of sticks tied together, 
were laid to create roads for vehicles. Meanwhile, supplies flooded in by rail. The Stavka had ordered that the troops were to be issued with five times their normal ammunition load for the offensive. This amount of shells, bullets and grenades would require 6,500 railway carriages to transport. In total, 400,000 tonnes of ammunition, 300,000 tonnes of fuel and more than 500,000 tonnes of food and forage were delivered to the troops in Bielorussia. It meant that every day, 100 supply trains arrived at the front. It was impossible to completely conceal preparations of such magnitude, but the German High Command still thought that the Soviet attack would come in Ukraine. Field Marshal Bush, commander of Army Group Center, went on leave three days before the Soviet offensive. His million-strong army group was about to be attacked by the combined strength of four Soviet fronts. 2.4 million soldiers, 5,200 tanks and self-propelled guns, and 5,300 aircraft. The final preparations for the offensive fell to Red Army engineers. Both sides had laid massive minefields in front of their lines. Now, the engineers would have to crawl into these minefields and begin to clear safe lanes for the attack. They would have to work in the dark and in silence, and they had just two nights to complete the job. The key element of any mine is the firing mechanism. Pressure on it causes the mine to explode. Demining involves, first of all, locating the mine, then removing or disabling the firing mechanism and then removing the disarmed mine to a safe place. The mine clearance teams had to work quickly and quietly. They knew that a single mistake could cost them their life. To save time, the engineers only removed detonators, leaving the actual mine in place. They also had to worry about German booby traps, including trip wires hidden amongst the long summer grass. Both sides were forced to constantly refine and update their methods to counter new threats or tricks devised by the enemy. Step by step, the engineers picked a path through this lethal landscape. In just two nights, they defused 34,000 mines. It was the final stage of preparation. Through these cleared lanes, the Red Army was now poised to launch one of the largest and most decisive operations in history. The final preparations had been made for the great Soviet summer offensive of 1944. A last-minute change to its timing only added to the weight of expectation. Operation Bagration would begin on the 22nd of June, the third anniversary of Germany's invasion. The offensive began on the northern flank with probing attacks in the vicinity of Vitebsk. Here, infantry of the 1st Baltic and 3rd Bielorussian fronts successfully stormed the German frontline trenches. By nightfall, Soviet units were engaged along the entire front as probing attacks gave way to full-blooded assault. Hundreds of aircraft arrived overhead to pour bombs onto the German front line. At dawn, the T-34s joined the assault. Swarms of Ilyushin ground attack aircraft crossed the front line with orders to hunt and destroy German artillery batteries in the enemy rear. German heavy artillery was a feared opponent, capable of stalling the whole offensive. But it was also extremely vulnerable to air attack. 
In low-level strafing attacks, the IL-2s used machine guns, cannons and rockets to mow down gun crews and destroy ammunition stockpiles. The Ilyushin IL-2 was designed by Sergei Ilyushin of the Soviet Central Design Bureau. It became the most heavily produced military aircraft of all time. The crew and engine were protected by armor. This was essential to protect them from small arms fire when making low-level attacks at an altitude of just 25 to 50 meters. The IL-2 was slow and therefore extremely vulnerable to German fighter attack. So by the second half of the war, they always flew their missions with a fighter escort. But by June 1944, the Luftwaffe was a shadow of its former self. German Army Group Center had just 40 fighters available for air defense. Its troops had been left wide open to Soviet air attack. Soviet Sturmovic ground attack aircraft roamed freely over the battlefield, often dispensing with their fighter escorts. Meanwhile, Hitler had come up with the idea of the fortress town. Troops defending locations with this special status were expected to fight to the last man, even when completely surrounded. One such fortress town was Vitebsk. The city was held by the 53rd Corps, part of General Reinhardt's 3rd Panzer Army. After the first day's fighting, Reinhardt proposed to withdraw his forces from Vitebsk before they became cut off. But Field Marshal Bush passed on the Führer's order. The city was to be held at all costs. On the third day of the battle, the Red Army duly encircled the 53rd Corps at Vitebsk. Only now, when it was too late, did Hitler authorize a retreat. But he still insisted that one division be left behind in Vitebsk with orders to fight to the end. The Germans' desperate attempt to escape the trap was doomed from the start. The breakout was led by the 4th Luftwaffe Field Division, which got as far as the forests to the southwest of the city. There, it came under overwhelming artillery and air attack and was annihilated. After five days of fighting, the German 53rd Corps capitulated. 17,000 survivors entered captivity, amongst them the Corps commander, General Golwitzer. The single German infantry division left in Vitebsk met a similar fate. The Red Army burst into the city, capturing the bridge over the western Dvina. The Germans tried to escape at the last minute, but all were either killed or captured. Meanwhile, to the south, Rokossovsky's first Belarusian front began their attack towards the city of Bobrusk. This was where Rokossovsky was attempting his controversial two-pronged assault, from the direction of Rogachev and from the village of Parici. Zhukov arrived to observe the assault of General Gorbatov's Third Army. With Rokossovsky directing the southern attack across the marshes and Zhukov coordinating the northern assault, a clear rivalry had developed as to who would be the first to crack the German lines. Near Rogachev, Soviet heavy bombers attacked under cover of darkness. They were helped to their target by Red Army trucks, drawn up in long lines facing eastwards with their headlights turned on. These lights, hidden from the Germans, pointed the Soviet pilots towards their target. In his memoirs, General Gorbatov wrote, First we heard the buzz of light aircraft flying over to attack the enemy positions. Then this noise was joined by the rumble of heavy aircraft, wave after wave of them. Soon the enemy lines erupted in explosions and flame. At dawn, Soviet ground attack aircraft continued the bombardment. They strafed German trenches and pummeled strong points with rockets and bombs.
Soviet air attacks could be wild and inaccurate. But now, they also began to take a fearsome psychological toll on the German soldiers. With no protection from the Luftwaffe, they lived in almost constant fear of a sudden, deadly attack from above. Before the smoke had cleared, shells and Katyusha rockets screamed through the air. As the bombardment raged, minesweeping tanks began their advance. Their heavy rollers detonated the mines in their path, clearing wide lanes for the tanks and self-propelled guns that followed in their wake. Despite this massive assault by land and air, the Red Army continued to encounter fierce German resistance around Rogachev. But further to the south, around the village of Parici, General Rokossovsky was making steady progress through the swamps and forests. Now he ordered forward General Pliev's mechanized cavalry corps to exploit the breach. Rokossovsky's gamble on a two-pronged assault had paid off. He had made a breakthrough, and he had done it before Zhukov. Army Group Center's only Panzer Division was ordered to make a counterattack near Rogachev. But at the last moment, it received urgent new orders to move south to block Rokossovsky's advance. Many of its vehicles broke down in the difficult, marshy terrain. But Rokossovsky had widened the breach and was already pouring in fresh troops. One Panzer Division was not going to stop him now. German defences around Rogachev, robbed of their tank reinforcement and under Zhukov's incessant hammer blows, now collapsed. The German 9th Army was encircled. Two days later, it surrendered. 20,000 Germans were taken prisoner. The Red Army's next objective was Minsk, the capital of Bielorussia. Its liberation was to be led by General Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army. The plan was for Rotmistrov's tanks to dash straight down the Smolensk-Minsk highway. But attempts to capture Orsha along the route had been bloodily repulsed. So the decision was taken to launch the attack from the vicinity of Vitebsk, where the Red Army had already blown a hole through the German defences. The 5,000 vehicles of the 5th Guards tank army began their attack towards Borisov, deep in the rear of Army Group Center. For two days, their advance met virtually no resistance. Meanwhile, Hitler had relieved Field Marshal Busch of command. His successor was Field Marshal Model, the so-called Führer's fireman and master of defense. But he inherited a desperate situation. Three Soviet fronts were advancing on Minsk. The Germans were in full retreat, hoping to reach the Berezina River. But the Red Army already held most of the crossing points. The Germans held just one bridge on the Mogilev-Minsk highway. Thousands of German vehicles, carts and soldiers were now converging on the bridge. One German witness described the scene. The scramble was wildest on the approaches to the bridge. Carts and cars were trying to push each other off the road. Each wanted to be first onto the bridge. There were fights and swearing. The military police were powerless. And always, there was the constant fear of air attack. Sturmovic ground attack aircraft mauled retreating columns of German troops. Increasingly, the situation began to resemble the summer of 1941. But now, the roles were reversed. It was the Germans' turn to flee in terror and confusion, under incessant attack from above. And now, they could expect neither respite nor mercy.
as German Army Group Center threatened to disintegrate, the Wehrmacht threw its medium bombers into the battle. It was hoped they could halt the Soviet tank columns and earn their own troops some desperately needed breathing space. But in the face of Soviet air superiority, daylight raids led to heavy losses for little gain. One week into the offensive, German panzer divisions began to arrive from Ukraine. The German 5th Panzer Division, reinforced with a battalion of Tiger tanks, prepared to meet the advance of Rotmistrov's army. The Tigers and Panthers slowed the Soviet advance to a bloody crawl. In July 1944, the 5th Guards Tank Army had yet to receive the new T-34-85 tanks. This updated version had a much more powerful 85mm gun. Although it didn't make them the equal of a German Tiger or Panther tank, it did make their encounters less one-sided. The tank battles raged for two days. The Red Army suffered enormous losses. But German tank strength was also reduced from 159 to just 18 tanks. The fate of Minsk was sealed. Tigers and Panthers had bought Army Group Center some time, but they couldn't prop up the entire front. At dawn on the 3rd of July, tanks of the 1st and 3rd Belarusian fronts rolled into Minsk from the north and southeast, encircling the remnants of two German armies. Meanwhile, the 2nd Belarusian front harried the German retreat from the east. It took a week to eradicate German resistance within Minsk. The encirclement at Minsk led to the capture of another 35,000 prisoners, including 12 generals. By now, German Army Group Center had suffered catastrophic losses. 17 of its divisions had been wiped out in just two weeks of fighting. The Germans had suffered total casualties estimated at 409,000. 150,000 of these were prisoners. The German panzer divisions remained a potent weapon, but Army Group Center no longer had the manpower to form a defensive line. Operation Bagration did not end until the 19th of August, by which time the Red Army had reached central Poland, the border of East Prussia and the Baltic Sea. Five Soviet fronts on a front of more than 1,000 kilometers had advanced between 550 and 600 kilometers. The success of the operation surpassed the wildest expectations of the Stavka High Command. After Operation Bagration, Stalin began to address Rokossovsky using both his name and patronymic Konstantin Konstantinovich. The only person he'd honored in this way before was Marshal Shaposhnikov, his most trusted general. The Soviet victory was so overwhelming that some foreign press agencies doubted whether the reports were accurate. So Stalin decided to prove it. He gave the order to begin Operation The Great Waltz, named after a popular American film of 1938. Trains from Belarusia secretly began to arrive in Moscow. The central Moscow Hippodrome and the Dynamo Stadium were cordoned off. On the 17th of July, it was announced to the public that German prisoners of war captured in Operation Bagration would be paraded through the streets of Moscow. 
Muscovites poured onto the streets to witness this strange spectacle. The procession was led by 19 German generals in full uniform. They were followed by more than a thousand officers. After them shuffled columns of weary, unshaven soldiers. This was what Stalin wanted the world to see, the fate of Adolf Hitler's once proud conquering army. The people of Moscow watched for the most part in silence. In many of their minds, the German soldier had become almost totally dehumanized. The Soviet people had been subjected to endless propaganda, but they had also suffered terrible and brutal losses. To many, the German soldier was a fascist beast, responsible for murders and rapes and the burning of villages and towns. Fifty-seven thousand German prisoners were paraded through the city en route to labor camps in the east. The procession was followed up by street cleaners, washing away all trace of the hated fascists. This startling display made a huge impression on Muscovites and foreign observers alike, as was its intention. Now. None had any doubt of the war's ultimate victorious conclusion. The collapse of German Army Group Center allowed the Red Army to advance towards Poland and East Prussia. In the Baltic region, the advance was led by General Bagramian's 1st Baltic Front and General Chernyakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front. On the 8th of July, Chernyakovsky's troops reached the outskirts of Vilnius. The city was soon surrounded, and after five days of vicious house-to-house -house fighting, the garrison laid down its arms. The Third Guard's mechanized corps made a bold and rapid advance, covering 70 kilometers to reach the Lithuanian city of Shole. On the 31st of July, the commander of its 8th Mechanized Brigade radioed Corps headquarters to tell them, we're on the beach of the Gulf of Riga. This short radio message meant something incredible. All German forces in the Baltic were now cut off. The commander's report was so unexpected that his Corps commander asked him to repeat it. Then he gave him the following unusual order. Fill three bottles with seawater, then seal the bottles and have the commander sign them personally to confirm that the water was taken from the Baltic Sea. Then send the bottles to Corps headquarters. The bottles of seawater were delivered to front headquarters by aircraft and from there sent to Moscow. They were on their way to Stalin. Soon, the bottles stood on a Kremlin table as proof that Soviet tanks had reached the sea. Operation Bagration had smashed open the Eastern Front. Now, the Red Army was on the move in the Baltic. Next stop was Tallinn. The Estonian capital was the objective of Red Army units of the 8th Estonian Rifle Corps under Lieutenant General Pern. He organized a motorized column which covered 100 kilometers in one day. His men stormed into Tallinn and took the city on the 22nd of September 1944. Now there just remained German Army Group North, trapped in the Courland Peninsula. Despite repeated requests from General Guderian, now chief of the general staff, Hitler refused to allow the troops to be evacuated from Courland. 
The German pocket in Courland was described as an armed prisoner of war camp. The troops trapped there ceased to have any influence on the course of the war. Army Group Courland finally laid down its arms on the 11th of May 1945, two days after Germany's surrender. The Red Army had reached the border of East Prussia. It was here, at Königsberg, that remnants of Army Group Center had withdrawn after defeat in Bielorussia. The shattered German formations had received new recruits and new weaponry. The Red Army couldn't safely bypass such a potential hornet's nest. Nor did the prospect of a long siege appeal to the Stavka. The decision was taken to isolate East Prussia with a thrust north into East Pomerania, towards Danzig on the Baltic coast. Then resistance in East Prussia would be methodically broken down. It would be hard. Many German units now fought fanatically to defend Germany from the wrath of the Red Army. The job of breaking through to the Baltic was entrusted to Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front. He attacked on the 14th of January 1945. But just one day into the offensive, the weather took a turn for the worse. Rokossovsky recalled, it was already daylight, but nothing could be seen. Everything was hidden by a veil of mist and falling snow. The weather was abominable, and the meteorologists predicted no improvement. So I cancelled all air operations. The artillery fired blindly into the snowstorm. The infantry advance was slow, just three or four kilometers on the first day. The Germans stiffened their defense with Tiger tanks and Sturmgeschutz assault guns. General Reinhardt, now in command of Army Group Center, still hoped to launch an armored counterattack to stem the Soviet advance. But his tanks were sent south to face more Soviet offensives on the Vistula. Reinhardt could only call on the elite Panzergrenadier Division Gross Deutschland. As it began its advance, it ran into 500 Soviet tanks of the Front Reserve. By 1945, the T-3485 was the main tank of the Red Army. It retained many of the characteristics of the earlier T-3476, such as excellent mobility and reliability. The main improvement was a powerful 85mm gun housed in a larger three-man turret. The size of the crew was increased to five. About 80,000 of these tanks were produced by the USSR before production finally came to an end in 1950. They remained in service with many armies around the world until the 1990s. After having defeated the enemy's tank reserve, Rokossovsky ordered forward the 5th Guards Tank Army. Reinhardt appealed to Hitler. My Führer, a captured enemy map shows that the Russian tank army is moving towards Danzig. If it gets through, we'll be attacked from the rear and unable to defend ourselves. Reinhardt requested permission to retreat. Nine days passed before Hitler agreed. By then, it was too late. The Soviet tanks had reached the Vistula Lagoon. East Prussia had been cut off from the Reich. Chernyakovsky's third Belarusian front had arrived at Königsberg from the east. German Army Group Center had been chopped into three parts. Bad weather prevented the Soviet Air Force attacking the retreating columns of men and vehicles. This allowed the Germans to assemble improvised fighting groups around Königsberg. 
they were still able to offer fierce resistance. On the 18th of February, 1945, General Chernyakovsky, commander of the 3rd Belarusian Front, was badly wounded by shell fragments at Melsak. He died the same day. He was just 39 years old. Marshal Vasilevsky arrived to take command of Soviet troops in East Prussia. Marshal Alexander Vasilevsky was the chief of the Soviet general staff for most of the war. This meant he was responsible for planning most of the major Soviet operations on the Eastern Front. He was described by colleagues as polite and diplomatic, and he was trusted by Stalin. However, some said Vasilevsky lacked the courage to stand up to him. Vasilevsky was twice decorated as hero of the Soviet Union. Gradually, German resistance in East Prussia was overcome. The pocket south of Königsberg was first to fall. Königsberg itself did not surrender until April 1945. In East Prussia, the Red Army faced fanatical German resistance. But Soviet firepower was overwhelming. In his memoirs, Vasilevsky described the East Prussian offensive as the most expensive in history in terms of the consumption of ammunition. He estimated that in this campaign, the Red Army used over 15,000 railway carriages of ammunition. The fortified city of Königsberg was finally pummeled into submission by the Soviet artillery. Its surrender netted the Red Army another 92,000 prisoners. By this point, Marshal Zhukov was putting the final touches on his plan for the assault on Berlin. To the south, fighting continued to rage in Czechoslovakia and Hungary. The second and third Ukrainian fronts battled elite SS divisions as they advanced on Austria. All had been made possible by the success of Operation Bagration. In the south, too, the Red Army had travelled a long and bitter road to victory. It had begun many miles to the east in 1943, as Soviet troops prepared to cross the Dnieper River. Before them lay the Battle of Ukraine.
habe ihn abgeschossen. Komm mal von oben. Lass dich nicht mit. Keine Ahnung. Der kann kaum flüchten. The first day of the war. Two Messerschmitt 109s were on the tail of a damaged Soviet Seagull fighter. Suddenly, another Seagull appeared behind the two German fighters. The Germans left the damaged plane and went after the new arrival. They put several holes through the Soviet aircraft, but were unable to shoot it down. This seagull was flown by Lieutenant Rech Karlov. This was his baptism of fire. Grigory Rech Karlov shot down his first German aircraft five days later. He went on to score 61 victories, making him the third highest scoring Soviet ace of the war. He was twice decorated as a hero of the Soviet Union, the USSR's highest award. A medical board had declared Rech Karlov unfit for combat because of color blindness. But when he reported to his regiment, the war had just begun and he was immediately pressed into service. Товарищ капитан, сержант Ричкалов прибыл в ваше распоряжение. Медицинская комиссия признан негодным, но прошу зачислить... Видишь тринадцатую чайку? Так точно. Быстренько подготовь ее к вылету, отвезешь бельцы пакет. Есть! In 1941, the main Soviet fighters were the I-153 Seagull and the I-16. They were designed by the Polykarpov Bureau, led by Nikolai Nikolaevich Polykarpov. The Seagull had a tight turning circle, but it was painfully slow compared to the German Messerschmitt 109. Soviet pilots first encountered the 109 during the Spanish Civil War. It was immediately clear that it posed a serious threat. The Messerschmitt 109 was designed by Willy Messerschmitt of the Bayerische Flugzeugwerke Company. It would become the most produced fighter of the war. By June 1941, the latest F variant had a top speed of 390 miles per hour, compared to the Seagull's 266 miles per hour. Its two machine guns and one 20mm cannon meant the 109 was also more heavily armed. The maneuverability of the Seagull meant Soviet pilots could often escape, but they could never fight on their own terms. On the first day of the war, more than 300 Soviet aircraft were shot down, but as many as 1,400 were destroyed on the ground. The worst losses were in Belorussia, where General Chernyuk's 9th Air Division, equipped with new MiG-3s, lost 347 of its 409 aircraft. Sergei Alexandrovich Chernyuk was a hero of the Soviet Union a veteran of the Spanish Civil War and the first Soviet pilot to shoot down a Messerschmitt 109. But now he became a scapegoat for the Air Force's failures and was arrested and shot. The Western Front lost 738 aircraft, 528 of them on the ground. When the Air Force commander in Bielorussia, General Kopets, realized the scale of the disaster, he shot himself. These men were talented young pilots who'd been rapidly promoted to high command to fill the vacuum created by Stalin's purge of senior Air Force officers. But when war came, they were out of their depth. Despite the enormous losses of the first day, the remnants of the Soviet Air Force began to fight back. On the 25th of June, 
27 Soviet Tupolev SB bombers attacked the German 2nd Panzer Group as it massed to cross the Shara River in Belorussia. The bombers destroyed vehicles and took out the river crossing. On the way back, the SBs were attacked by German fighters. Ten were shot down. Soviet ground attack and fighter regiments were under army command, but bombers were under front or army group command. It proved almost impossible to coordinate their actions. Bombers attacked without fighter protection, while fighters were ordered to attack ground targets. Poor Soviet tactics were also being exposed. Bomber pilots had been trained to fly in loose formations, meaning their machine guns couldn't cover each other. Soviet tactics and organization needed a rapid overhaul. Nevertheless, Soviet bombers continued to attack German ground forces, as well as strategic targets including Königsberg in East Prussia, Warsaw, the Romanian port of Constanza, and the Ploiesti oil refineries. One of the pilots defending the vital Romanian oil fields was Oberleutnant Gunther Wall. On the 26th of June, his unit intercepted Soviet bombers returning from a raid on Ploiesti. Rahl shot down three bombers. His fellow pilots destroyed six more. Gunter Rahl enlisted in the infantry in 1936. Two years later, he transferred to the Luftwaffe to train as a fighter pilot. He first saw action over France in 1940, where he scored two victories. He ended the war as Germany's third most successful fighter pilot, with 275 kills to his name. German pilots not only had the advantage of superior aircraft, they also had excellent training. They followed the maxim of the legendary First World War fighter race, the Red Baron himself, Manfred von Richthofen. Find the enemy and shoot him down. Anything else is nonsense. German fighter pilots fought almost a separate war, more like an athletic contest, in which only their individual scores mattered. Drawing on their experience of the Spanish Civil War, Luftwaffe fighter pilots had invented their own tactics. They flew in a flexible formation made up of two pairs, known as the Finger Four, which allowed them to utilize their superior speed. Other air forces, including the British and Soviet, flew in rigid V-shaped formations, in which pilots spent most of their time concentrating on holding position. In the Soviet case, a tight formation was essential because most aircraft did not yet have radios. Section leaders had to communicate by waggling their wings or using hand signals. It left the pilots with no freedom to maneuver. In the weeks leading up to the German invasion, a brand new aircraft began to arrive at Soviet ground attack regiments. It was the Il-2, and it would become the most famous Soviet aircraft of the war. The Il-2 Sturmovik was designed by Sergei Ilyushin and entered service in May 1941. His creation was soon nicknamed the Flying Tank. The Il-2 carried cannon, machine guns, bombs and rockets, and was protected from ground fire by armor plating. More than 36,000 were eventually built, making it the most produced military aircraft in history. The first unit to receive the Il-2 was the 4th Sturmovik Regiment. But the war began before its pilots had had a chance to train with it. They'd practiced takeoffs and landings, but hadn't flown in formation or even fired the aircraft's weapons yet. 
Some of the pilots had never seen an RS rocket before, and now they were expected to use them in combat. On the 27th of June, pilots Spitsin, Filipov, and Kolobayev flew off on their first mission. They attacked a German column from low altitude. They could only use their machine guns, since the 20 mm cannon had a production defect. All the pilots returned to the airfield. Kolobayev's plane was riddled with holes. The fuselage was covered with oil. The aircraft was a write-off, but he had survived. A week later, the regiment received a citation from the front commander for destroying nine crossings over the Berezina River. But losses were high. By mid-July, of the regiment's 56 aircraft, only 10 remained in service. In August, the regiment handed its last three aircraft to a neighboring unit and headed east for rebuilding. In the first summer of the war, an Aleutian II was destroyed on average after just eight or nine missions. In some regiments, after just three or four. But better tactics and training would gradually improve these survival rates. By 1945, the average had gone up to 90 missions. That autumn, Grigory Richkarlov was wounded during a combat mission. Despite serious leg injuries, he managed to land his aircraft back at base. By then, his score stood at three German aircraft destroyed. By the end of 1941, the Soviet Air Force had lost more than 20,000 aircraft. The Luftwaffe, just 3,800. But despite this success, the Luftwaffe proved unable to effectively target Soviet transport and infrastructure. The Luftwaffe had been designed primarily to support ground operations. It lacked the aircraft to carry out strategic bombing. The Luftwaffe was unable to prevent the evacuation of Soviet industry to the Urals or, crucially, prevent Red Army reinforcements moving up from the Russian interior. German air raids against Moscow underlined this weakness. Soviet fighters, supported by formidable anti-aircraft defenses, were able to prevent any serious damage to the capital. By the winter counter-attack, the Soviet Air Force outnumbered the Luftwaffe by almost three to one. And soon, it would start to receive some desperately needed modern aircraft. Above an airfield in Russia, an aircraft slowed, began to shudder, and then fell into a spin. Down below, its designer, Semyon Lavoshkin, feared the worst. The day before, he told the pilots, don't test it for tailspin. You'll destroy the prototype and yourselves. But the pilot quickly recovered and returned to level flight. Two weeks later, the State Defense Committee approved production of the Lag 3 fighter with a new M82 engine. It would be called the LA-5. 
Its predecessor, the Lag-3, was designed in 1940 by Lavoshkin, Gorbanov, and Gudkov. Because of the USSR's shortage of aluminium, the aircraft had a wooden frame with key sections made from a wood veneer that was treated with Bakelite and compressed at high temperature. This made the wood very strong and fire-resistant, but it was heavy compared to aluminium. Its weight and an underpowered engine made the Lag-3 sluggish and unmaneuverable. In the autumn of 1941, it was decided to cease production of lag fighters and concentrate instead on the Yak-7. In late 1941, the Yak-7B was considered the best Soviet fighter. It was armed with one cannon and two machine guns and had a top speed of 365 miles per hour. The Lavoshkin Design Bureau faced closure. Its saviour was a new, more powerful M82 air-cooled engine. Installed in the Lag-3 airframe, it gave birth to the LA-5, and the Lavoshkin Bureau was back in business. On the 21st of March 1942, a few days before the Bureau was evacuated to the Caucasus, test pilot Vasily Mishenko took the prototype for its first flight. In the first year of the war, the Soviets had lost huge swathes of territory and suffered devastating losses. Of 22,600 tanks available at the start of the war, about 2,000 were left. From 20,000 aircraft, just 2,000. And of 110,000 guns and mortars, 2,800. These losses had to be made good quickly, but at the same time, Soviet factories had to be evacuated east to safety. The People's Commissariat of Aviation Industry had evacuated 118 factories, 85% of its facilities. Nine major tank plants were evacuated. By the end of 1941, more than 10 million people and 2,500 enterprises had been relocated. The task required more than one and a half million rail wagons. On arrival, most factories resumed production immediately. The Soviet Air Force, meanwhile, was putting into practice the painful lessons of 1941. In March 1942, the Air Force received a new commander, General Novikov. He immediately recommended that its units be concentrated into air armies, making it easier to manage and coordinate air operations. Soviet fighter pilots learned new tactics, some drawn from combat experience, others borrowed from the Luftwaffe. The Air Force abandoned its mixed air groups. Instead, fighters, Sturmoviks and bombers were formed into specialized divisions. Obsolete aircraft, such as the Seagull, were gradually replaced by new Yaks, Lavoshkins, and Ilyushins. The LA-5 made its debut in August 1942 over Stalingrad. Gunther Rahl gave his assessment of the new aircraft. The Russians were quick learners. The LA-5, based on the inefficient Lag-3, was a great plane. All German pilots soon learned to respect the LA-5. It had particularly impressive performance at low altitude, where it could outturn a Messerschmitt 109 and outclimb a Fokker Wolf 190. However, the Soviets continued to suffer heavy pilot losses. The situation was described in a report by the 49th Fighter Regiment. The LA-5 is the best type of Soviet fighter. The regiment's losses are explained by the fact that 45% of personnel are young pilots. Casualties included three sergeants with 15 to 17 flying hours on LA-5s and two lieutenants with similar background. Only one in five is an experienced pilot. 
pilot, training would remain one of the Soviet Air Force's greatest failings until the end of the war. Soviet flight schools suffered from a shortage of instructors and of fuel. Pilots graduated after just 90 days of basic instruction. They concentrated on takeoffs and landings. Acrobatics were strictly forbidden because they led to too many accidents. As a result, pilots often arrived at their unit with as little as eight hours flying experience. Often, none of it on the aircraft the unit was equipped with. Nor had they been trained how to fly in bad weather. Flight school graduates received virtually no instruction in air combat. Most had done some target shooting. But few knew much about deflection shooting or how to use their gun sights. These men were expected to fight German pilots with hundreds of combat missions under their belt. But what they lacked in experience, they made up for in spirit. Sergei Gorolov typified the commitment of Soviet fighter pilots. We were eager for battle and ready to die in combat. We even said our goodbyes before going on a mission. In late 1942, Grigory Rychkanov's regiment was withdrawn from the front in order to retrain on new aircraft. American Aerocobras sent to the USSR as part of the Allied Lend-Lease program of military aid. Of all the types of Allied aircraft supplied through Lend-Lease, this was the pilot's favorite. <laughs> The Bell P-39 Aerocobra had one unusual design feature. The engine was situated behind the pilot. Half of the 10,000 Aerocobras built by Bell were sent to the Soviet Union under the terms of Lend-Lease. The aircraft carried a 37mm cannon and two heavy calibre machine guns. Besides Rechkalov, other Aerocobra pilots included Nikolai Guleyev, the fourth highest scoring Soviet ace with 57 confirmed kills, and Alexander Pokrishkin, the third highest with 59 kills. Rechkalov, who liked to hunt alone in his Aerocobra, won 42 victories in 1943. He finished the war with 61 confirmed victories. By the war's end, Rech Karlov had twice been decorated as a hero of the Soviet Union. In April 1943, the Red Army's North Caucasus Front began an offensive against the Kuban Bridgehead on the Black Sea coast. Their aim was to break through the German fortification system known as the Blue Line and to liberate Taman. After six days of fierce fighting, the 56th Army had succeeded in capturing just one German stronghold, the village of Krimskaya. Any further Red Army advance became impossible in the face of massive German airstrikes launched from Luftwaffe bases in the Kerch Peninsula. The Soviet offensive had to be called off on the 15th of May. That summer, 
A vicious struggle for air superiority raged over the Kuban bridgehead. On one side, the Soviet 4th Air Force under General Vershinin. On the other, Field Marshal von Richthofen's 4th Air Fleet. It would prove the beginning of the end for Luftwaffe supremacy on the Eastern Front. The Soviet Union's top ace was Ivan Nikitovich Kazhadub. Kazhadub spent two years as a flight instructor and only joined a frontline fighter regiment in the spring of 1943, where he flew LA-5s. By the end of the war, he had shot down 62 enemy aircraft, making him the highest scoring Allied ace of the war. He was also a three times hero of the Soviet Union. In his first 40 missions, Kazhadub failed to shoot down any enemy aircraft. Instead, he often returned with his own plane badly damaged. But his chance would come at the Battle of Kursk. In the summer of 1943, near Kursk, the Wehrmacht planned a massive two-pronged offensive that would lead to the encirclement and destruction of substantial Red Army forces. The Red Army had never before withstood the combined German assault of tanks, artillery and aircraft. Kolobayev, meanwhile, was instructing young pilots of the 7th Guard Sturmovik Regiment. Above all, Kolobayev extolled the virtues of aggression in his pilots. He urged them to attack without hesitation. By 1943, Soviet Sturmovik regiments had developed tactics based on solid combat experience. They began with a nosedive from 3,000 feet to just a few hundred. Then they would form a circle. This formation gave them freedom to maneuver, select their ground targets, and engage them with cannon, machine guns, bombs, and rockets. As they made their attack, the aircraft following behind protected them from German fighters. Just before the Battle of Kursk, IL-2 units received a new anti-tank weapon, the P-TAB aerial bomb. Grigory Cherkashin was one pilot to use the new weapon. P-TABs are our best weapon against tanks. They're a beast. Six Sturmoviks approach an armored column the first unloads its four hatches, then the second, then the third. The Germans unleashed their Kursk offensive on the 5th of July, 1943. The next day, Kazhadub shot down his first German aircraft. Over the next two days, he shot down three more. In one battle, Lieutenant Gorovitz was credited with destroying nine Stukas, the last by ramming it, before his heavily damaged LA-5 was shot down. At the cost of his own life, Alexander Konstantinovich Gorovitz set a Soviet record of destroying nine enemy aircraft in a single mission. The exact number of aircraft shot down by the World War II aces remains the subject of heated debate. The nature of air combat made it difficult to be sure if an aircraft had been shot down or just damaged. The Soviet Air Force, like all others, required victories to be corroborated by witnesses in the air or on the ground, or for kills to be confirmed by gun camera footage. But pilots on all sides were prone to exaggerate the number of aircraft they'd shot down. In the Battle of Britain, for instance, 
Fighter pilots claimed for about twice as many aircraft as were actually shot down. Ich bin abgeschossen. Ich kann das Flugzeug nicht steuern. Der Motor brennt. At Kursk, the air battle raged with as much ferocity as the fighting on the ground. One thing was clear. The Luftwaffe no longer had things all its own way. Experienced German aces flying high-performance modern aircraft continued to exact a heavy toll on the Soviet Air Force. But Sergei Gorolov exemplified the Soviet learning curve. By Kursk, I'd learned how to maneuver and shoot accurately. Now we had reliable radios and ground control. While I destroyed one plane in 1941, in 1942 I got five, and in summer of 1943, 20. The Lavoshkin fighter played an important role in his success. In 1943, it received a new engine with direct fuel injection, which made it a solid match for the latest Messerschmitt 109. On the 3rd of August, Gorolov and nine other LA-5 pilots were escorting Sturmoviks to their target when they were jumped by 35 enemy fighters. In the ensuing dogfight, eight Messerschmitts were shot down, two of them by Gorolov. When attacking a formation of Soviet Sturmoviks and fighter escorts, German fighters would climb 500 meters above them. There, they would circle, waiting for the optimum moment to make a diving attack. Their plan was simple. Strike at maximum speed, take out a Sturmovik, and then climb away to safety. These high-speed diving attacks were made at more than 400 miles per hour. The escort fighters' orders were to stay with the slower, less maneuverable Sturmoviks and protect them from these attacks. They would turn to face the attacking German aircraft and open a defensive fire, which, even if it missed, might force him to break off his attack. The escort would then rejoin the formation. It could be a frustrating experience for Soviet fighter pilots, forbidden to pursue and destroy damaged enemy fighters. German aces scored many victories with these high-speed diving attacks. But there weren't enough of them to prevent the Sturmoviks carrying out their mission, to bomb and strafe German ground forces without mercy. On the 4th of February, 1944, 1st Lieutenant Kezhidub was awarded the gold star of a hero of the Soviet Union for destroying 20 enemy aircraft in 146 missions. His comrade, Sergei Kramarenko, described this exceptional pilot. Lots of pilots envied him, thinking he must be really lucky hitting so many planes without being hit. I mean, it's really rare. But after flying with him a few times, I realized that behind the luck lay lightning reactions and excellent situational awareness. Kozadal had an instinctive understanding of aerial combat. He was always in the right place at the right time. Then all he had to do was push the gun button. Ich falle runter. Ich falle runter. 
Wasser. Die Maschine brennt. Ich kann nicht rausspringen. Die Luke verklebt. In 1943, British and American Air Forces launched their combined bomber offensive against Germany. The Casablanca Directive stated its goals. The progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial and economic system and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their capacity for armed resistance is fatally weakened. Germany was to be bombed around the clock. The Americans attacking by day, the British at night. On the Eastern Front, German pilots were able to hunt freely. But against Allied bombers and their fighter escorts, they no longer had the option to fight only on their own terms. On two fronts, the Luftwaffe was slowly being ground into submission. Shortly before dawn, on the 23rd of June, 1944, the alert was sounded at the 7th Guard Sturmovik Regiment. All personnel formed up on the airfield. The regiment had been completely remanned three times, and the men who began the war in Belarusia were long gone. Commander Kolobayev had been promoted and transferred. The men stood to attention. A parade was being held to mark the start of Operation Bagration. Это знамя обогрено кровью наших боевых друзей, сражавшихся в этих местах еще в первые месяцы войны. Теперь в строю гвардейцев стоит их достойная смена. Operation Bagration with Sturmovik regiments in the lead, resulted in the destruction of an entire German army group. The Red Army had cracked the Eastern Front wide open. A commission had been sent to assess the efficiency of the 230th Ground Assault Division, of which the 7th Guards Regiment was a part. They found that in one day, the division destroyed more than 100 vehicles, six tanks, and 20 guns. As the Germans retreated through Bielorussia, traffic jams formed, particularly around the river crossings. With the Luftwaffe nowhere to be seen, the columns were at the mercy of the Soviet Air Force. In April 1945, the Soviet Air Force prepared to support the Red Army's final offensive across the Oder River and into Berlin. They would outnumber the Luftwaffe almost seven to one, but the German 6th Air Fleet could be counted on to fight desperately in defense of the capital. Наши войска, наступающие на Берлин, останутся без горючки и снарядов. Ключевые точки операции в следующем. Three pairs of LA-7s took off to guard the crossings. Ivan Kashadub was in the lead. Below them, they spotted 32 Fokker Wolf 190s flying in two groups. Kajadub descended, slipped onto the German formation, and attacked the lead aircraft. Mm -hmm. 
A Fokker Wolf opened fire on Kajadub. His wingman shot down the German at almost point-blank range. Using their speed, the Soviet fighters climbed and attacked the second enemy group. Kajadub destroyed another plane. Then another. A dogfight began as pilots twisted and turned, trying to get into a good firing position on an enemy aircraft. In spite of their superior numbers, the Fokker Wolves turned tail and fled west, pursued by the Lavoshkins. Back at base, the scores were tallied up. Kajadub had shot down three aircraft, getting away with a few holes in his tail. Gromakovsky had two, and Kumanitsi, Stetsenko and Olov, one each. The once mighty Luftwaffe had been chased from the sky and Soviet fighter pilots roamed at will over the enemy's capital. Several became aces in the final days of the war. Amongst them, Vladimir Gromakovsky, who shot down five aircraft during the Berlin offensive, and Viktor Alexandruk, who claimed seven. On the night of the 9th of May, pilots woke to the sound of gunshots. They sprung out of bed and raced outside with their sidearms. German regiments were still trying to fight their way to the west, sometimes attacking airfields in their path. But the shots were being fired into the air. News had arrived of the German unconditional surrender. The war was finally over. For the Soviet Air Force, it had been a costly and bloody struggle. But from the devastating defeats of 1941 had emerged a ruthless and powerful Air Force that had played its full part in the final Soviet victory. On the deck of a German warship, the crew rolled trolleys loaded with huge metal spheres towards the stern. It was nearly midnight on the 21st of June 1941, the eve of the German invasion of the Soviet Union and German warships were busy mining the Gulf of Finland. There were just a few hours left before the first German air raids hit the Soviet Union, and the German ambassador in Moscow handed over a declaration of war. But here in the Baltic, 
the war had already begun. Unlike the Army and Air Force, the Soviet Navy was expecting war. For three days, it had been on high alert. Its ships and aircraft mounted regular patrols to give early warning of any incoming attack. Just before midnight on the 21st of June, the Navy was put on red alert by its commander, People's Commissar Nikolai Kuznetsov. But while Soviet airfields were hammered on the first day of the war, the Navy was hardly in the firing line at all. The main Baltic naval base at Tallinn wasn't even attacked. But naval mobilization still left plenty to be desired. Submarine commander Peter Grishenko was asleep when the Germans attacked. But it was not the submarine base that was being attacked. It was the airfield. If the bombers had targeted the Soviet fleet, there was every chance they could have pulled off a German Pearl Harbor. But the Germans planned instead to blockade Soviet ships in their ports with mines. The Soviet Navy was divided between four distinct operational zones, the Baltic Sea and Black Sea, the Arctic and the Far East. The distances involved were vast, it was a sea voyage of nearly 9,000 miles from Vladivostok to Leningrad. In 1941, the Soviet Navy possessed few large modern warships. Its expansion had focused instead on submarines and light ships, a strategy advocated by several young Soviet naval theorists. The argument ran one submarine can disable a battleship. Several submarines can impede the actions of several fleets. The doctrine received official approval. People's Commissar of Defense, Clement Voroshilov, declared, All we want is to protect our coasts and borders. Our light forces, naval aviation and submarines will cripple an attacking enemy. The USSR began a massive program of submarine construction. The Navy conducted maneuvers in which submarines practiced working with coastal batteries, aircraft and light ships to repel an enemy naval attack. At the outbreak of war, the Soviet Navy had three battleships, seven light cruisers, 54 destroyers, 215 submarines, 22 guard ships, 290 torpedo boats, and 62 subhunters. All three battleships dated back to the days of the Tsar. The Baltic fleet was strongest, with two battleships, two modern light cruisers, and 21 destroyers. The Northern Fleet was weakest, with just eight destroyers. The German Navy, in contrast, had three battleships, eight cruisers, 34 destroyers, and 155 submarines. At 6.30 a.m. on the 22nd of June, Baltic Fleet Headquarters received orders from People's Commissar Kuznetsov. But such a course could have little effect, as Admiral Pantiliev pointed out. The Nazi Navy had no intention of entering the Gulf of Finland. On the contrary, it intended to blockade us inside it. A cruiser, covered by a smokescreen, 
maneuvered slowly through the harbour of Tallinn. Every few minutes, its main guns roared out. The cruiser Kirov was firing at German troops advancing on the Estonian capital. The enemy retaliated with heavy artillery. This was why the Kirov kept on the move, hiding amongst the smoke. By late August 1941, the Red Army had been forced to yield most of its Baltic conquests. Only Tallinn remained, a last Soviet bastion in Estonia. The Germans and their Finnish allies were determined to prevent the evacuation of Tallinn by sea. There were only two navigable channels to the city, one along the coast and one through the middle of the Gulf of Finland. The Germans and Finns filled this central channel with two and a half thousand mines. The sea mine was a highly effective naval weapon, responsible for one-fifth of all shipping losses during the war. The German EM, or moored contact mine, consisted of a hollow sphere with seven thin horns. Inside, in a watertight box, was a 300 kilogram explosive charge. Most of the sphere was empty, so the mine would float. The mine was rolled overboard with its trolley, to which it was attached by a cable. The trolley acted as the mine's anchor and held it in place. The cable length could be adjusted to set the depth of the mine. The metal horns triggered the mine. When a ship hit one, it broke an acid container within the horn. This turned it into a battery and sent an electric charge to the detonator. The mine would then explode. Having fought their way to the coast, the Germans opened fire on the navigation channel. Nebel. Man sieht nichts. Worauf sollen wir schießen? But neither artillery nor the mines could prevent Soviet transports reaching Tallinn. Soviet mine hunters led the way. Because of their shallow draft, they passed safely over the mines, dragging a trawl that cut their cables. When a mine floated to the surface, it was destroyed with gunfire, creating safe lanes through the minefield. During August, a steady stream of wounded Soviet soldiers and refugees were evacuated from Tallinn by sea. But it took a heavy toll on the Soviet mine hunters. Some hit shallow mines. Others were sunk by TMA influence mines, triggered by a ship's magnetic field. On the 26th of August, Stalin telegrammed Voroshilov, authorizing a withdrawal from Tallinn and the evacuation of its garrison by sea. The operation called for an armada of more than 200 Soviet ships. They would have to run a gauntlet of German and Finnish aircraft and torpedo boats, and minefields that could not be cleared because of bad weather. The convoy departed Tallinn at noon on the 28th of August, carrying 28,000 soldiers and refugees. The ships sailed in the central channel, meaning German and Finnish coastal batteries fired at extreme range. Luftwaffe dive bombers joined the attack as Soviet destroyers laid smoke screens to protect the convoy. There were dozens of mines in the channel. They soon began to claim their victims. The cruisers and destroyers forged ahead, making for the heavily defended naval base at Kronstadt. The slower transports were left behind. German aircraft fell upon them like vultures. Of the 75 transports that left Tallinn, 12 were destroyed by mines and 19 by aircraft.
If the warships had slowed down to protect the convoy, the losses might have been fewer. But the fleet commander needed his warships back safely. The Baltic fleet could not be sacrificed. The cruiser Kirov reached Kronstadt without serious damage, as did 11 of 13 submarines, but only five out of 10 destroyers. Of the 28,000 evacuees, two thirds arrived safely. But more than 15,000 lives had been lost on the 200 mile voyage from Tallinn. Within days, the Germans began their assault on Leningrad. The warships, saved by the brutal decision to abandon the Tallinn convoy, would play a vital part in the city's defense. Hitler's hopes of a rapid victory against the Soviet Union had been dashed. As the war entered its second year, the Germans became increasingly concerned about their own shipping routes. Vital supplies of Swedish iron ore came across the Baltic and along the Norwegian coast. Chrome ore came across the Black Sea from neutral Turkey. The Germans turned to their sophisticated sea mines to protect all these shipping lanes. In 1942, they created huge minefields along Norway's northern coast, watched over by aircraft and coastal batteries. It had an immediate and deadly impact on Soviet submarine patrols. In April 1942, the Schur 421 hit a German mine and sank. The same month, Schur 401 went missing on patrol. Three further submarines were lost in quick succession. Sinkings by Soviet Northern Fleet submarines dropped off rapidly from 21 in the first half of 1942 to just four in the second half of the year. They came at a cost of nine submarines. The sailors of the Baltic Fleet suffered all the hardships of their home base, the besieged city of Leningrad. Rations were so meager that many of them suffered the effects of malnutrition. Meanwhile, German factories were turning Swedish iron ore into tanks, guns and shells. Only the submarines of the Baltic fleet could disrupt this supply. On the 2nd of July, 1942, S-7 under Commander Leeson, slipped through the minefields of the Gulf of Finland. Sweden was neutral, but while surfaced, Leeson came under attack from Swedish aircraft and was lucky to escape. That night, Leeson sank the Swedish transport Margareta, loaded with coal. Two days later, he sank another Swedish ship, Lulio, carrying iron ore to Germany. The Swedes claimed both ships had been sunk within territorial waters, a violation of their neutrality. The Soviets denied this, but felt it prudent to order S-7 away from the Swedish coast. On the 30th of July, Leeson sighted four more ships. To overtake them, he took a huge risk sailing on the surface at full speed in broad daylight. He attacked from a depth of just 20 feet. If detected, he stood little chance of escape. But Leeson's audacity paid off. The German transport Kata was sunk. S-7 had no torpedoes left and was heading home when a Finnish steamer was detected. Yes, 
the main deck gun had jammed, so the crew opened fire with their anti-aircraft gun. It took almost 400 shells to sink her. From the wreckage, Leeson picked up the Finnish captain and his engineer and brought them to Leningrad. It was a very rare example of a submarine taking prisoners. Four crew members of the S-7 were decorated. Leeson was recommended for the highest award, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. In September 1942, S-12 under Commander Turiev left on patrol. But one day in, she was damaged in an attack by Finnish aircraft. Her leaking oil tanks left a greasy trail on the water's surface. Then, the sonar operator picked up the sound of propellers. The submarine's batteries were almost dead, and she was in shallow water. On the charts, Turiev spotted a small 60-meter deep trench on the sea floor. The seabed all around was 40 meters. This was where the Finns would set their depth charges to explode. S-12 descended into the trench. The submarine was rocked by exploding depth charges and battered by debris from the seabed. But she suffered no serious damage. After dark, S-12 made her escape. But Turiev had no intention of cutting short his patrol. He made a torpedo attack on the aging German battleship Schlesien, but missed. He was finally forced back to base by autumn storms. On the 17th of October, 1942, Commander Liesen took S-7 on a second Baltic patrol. But while recharging batteries on the surface, S-7 was attacked by a Finnish submarine. Four men of the upper watch, including Commander Leeson, were thrown clear. The other 42 crew members perished. It was from inside a Finnish prisoner of war camp that Leeson heard he'd been made a hero of the Soviet Union. When Finland signed an armistice in 1944, Leeson returned to active service. He fought against Japan in 1945 and finally retired from the service in 1970. In 1942, Soviet submarines had struck a small but significant blow against Germany's vital supply line across the Baltic Sea. But it came at a heavy price. In 1942, Soviet submarines sank at least 21 ships and damaged a further nine. But of 27 Baltic Fleet submarines on patrols, 12 did not return. And what was already a dangerous environment for Soviet submarines was about to become a death trap. By the end of 1941, it was clear that Hitler faced a long struggle against the Soviet Union. He assigned the German Air Force and Navy the task of stopping Allied aid convoys reaching Russia across the Arctic Ocean. These convoys brought much-needed shipments of food, supplies and vehicles to the northern ports of Murmansk and Arkhangelsk. Cargo ships from North America and Britain were assembled into convoys and assigned a naval escort for the dangerous Arctic crossing to northern Russia. The proximity to German-occupied Norway made the protection of warships essential. Convoys bound for the USSR were codenamed PQ, and those returning, QP. 
The first Allied convoy of seven merchant ships arrived without loss at Arkhangelsk on the 31st of August, 1941. The convoys passed within 200 miles of the Norwegian coast at speeds of no more than 10 knots. Conditions on the crossing could be horrendous. Waves the size of houses, temperatures of minus 30 degrees centigrade, and incessant Arctic gales. Destroyers of the Soviet Northern Fleet joined the escort for the final leg of the journey to Russia and provided defense against German air and submarine attack. The early convoys to Russia consisted of no more than a dozen transport ships, and the first seven convoys suffered no losses at all. The first U-boat attack against an Arctic convoy did not occur until January 1942 and resulted in the loss of one transport from convoy PQ-7A. But as the convoys increased in size, so too did their losses. Convoy PQ-17 set sail in June 1942 with 34 ships, of which 23 were sunk by German aircraft and U-boats. This disaster led to the suspension of Arctic convoys for three months. Hitler, in his determination to choke off any aid to the Soviet Union, sent heavy reinforcements to Norway, including the mighty new battleship Tirpitz. She was a sister ship to the Bismarck and, like her, carried a fearsome battery of eight 15-inch guns. Soviet sub K-21, under Commander Lunin, was also bound for Norway. On the afternoon of the 5th of July, 1942, K-21's sonar officer reported the sound of heavy warships. It was the Tirpitz, leading a German squadron to intercept the Allied convoy PQ-17. Lunin used his periscope to observe the target, although he knew that in clear weather, there was a danger that its wake could be spotted by a German lookout. The German ships were moving at high speed, leaving only a small window for Lunin to make his attack. As Lunin made his approach, the warship suddenly changed course. He had to act quickly. From inside the enemy formation, K-21 attacked with its stern torpedo tubes. Lunin fired four torpedoes, then waited for the sound of explosions. The sonar officer reported two explosions. Lunin radioed the fleet commander, claiming a hit on the Tirpitz. But they were wrong. The torpedoes had missed. Meanwhile, in the Black Sea, Soviet submarines were also active in hunting down the enemy. Lookouts on the Schur 205 studied a freighter that carried no national flag. According to an Anglo-Turkish agreement, all chromor mined in neutral Turkey was to be bought up by Great Britain, thus depriving Germany of its main supply of chrome, which it needed for alloys used in the armaments industry. But Turkey continued to sell chrome ore to Germany as well, in shipments sent to Bulgaria, which Soviet submarines tried to intercept. 
the Turkish freighter Dua Tepe spotted the submarine and raced for an inlet. Captain Lieutenant Suhem Linov gave the order to open fire with the deck gun. A stream of shells soon reduced the Dua Tepe to a blazing wreck. The submarine's next victim was the Turkish transport, Shafak. Two torpedoes tore the small ship to pieces. The Schur 205's next mission was to deliver ammunition to the besieged naval base of Sebastopol. When the ammunition was unloaded, 50 wounded soldiers were crammed into the small submarine for evacuation. The Schur 205 survived around 40 bomb and depth charge attacks before reaching the safety of Novorossiysk on the Black Sea's eastern shore. The Black Sea was less dangerous for Soviet subs than the narrow straits of the Baltic. But shallow coastal waters posed their own risk. The sea was often no more than 10 to 15 meters deep and could be heavily mined by the Germans. Soviet submarine commanders had to be bold and aggressive. In October 1942, Commander Greshilov in a small M-class submarine, sank the 500-ton German tanker Le Progress as she sailed under escort near the Danube Delta. In August 1943, Greshilov, now commanding a larger Pike-class submarine, struck again, sinking the Turkish transport Tisby under the noses of her escort of two destroyers and two sub-hunters. She went to the bottom with 1,600 tons of chrome ore aboard her. In 1944, Greshilov was awarded the USSR's highest honor, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. Back in the Baltic, the threat posed by Soviet submarines caused the Germans to take drastic new measures. Minefields alone were clearly not working. In the spring of 1943, the Germans began erecting huge steel nets across the Gulf of Finland. This double anti-submarine net, codenamed Walrus, stretched 25 miles from Nysa Island off the coast of Estonia to the coast of Finland. The net was too strong for even the largest submarine to break through. For good measure, the Germans and Finns laid another 9,000 mines in the Gulf of Finland. On Hogland Island, they built an underwater listening station to detect passing submarines. When the winter ice melted, the first Soviet submarines attempted to break through this formidable array of defenses. In May 1943, Schur 303, under the command of Ivan Travkin, left Kronstadt bound for the Baltic. Two days into the patrol, sonar reported a rhythmic, metallic rasping against the hull. Travkin made several attempts to get through the net, but all ended in failure. With sonar also picking up several enemy anti-submarine patrols, Travkin decided to report his findings and head for home. Schur 408 was less lucky. She was detected and sunk by enemy patrol craft. Schur 406, under the command of hero of the Soviet Union, Yevgeny Osipov, also never returned to base. When Travkin returned, he and his crew were greeted like men back from the dead. 
The Baltic Fleet Command tried bombing the nets from the air. Submarines tried firing torpedoes at it. But neither had any effect. Two more submarines, the S-9 and S-12, were lost whilst investigating the net. After that, all attempts to break through were suspended. For the time being, the Germans had succeeded in trapping and neutralizing the entire Soviet Baltic fleet. In the Black Sea, it was the German Luftwaffe that posed the greatest threat to the Soviet Navy. In the first weeks of the war, the Soviet Black Sea Fleet conducted raids against Romanian ports and later against the German-occupied Crimea. The first raid, just four days into the war, targeted oil storage facilities at the Romanian port of Costanza. But after a short bombardment, the destroyer Moskva hit a mine and sank rapidly, leading to the withdrawal of the raiding force. Soviet Marines also carried out small-scale raids against Romanian targets. After the fall of the Crimea, the Black Sea Fleet targeted Axis forces stationed on its coastline. In October 1943, three destroyers, Kharkov, Sposotny and Bespeshadny, left the East Coast to conduct a nighttime bombardment of German positions at Yalta and Feodosia. Then they sailed for home. At dawn, the destroyers were attacked by eight Stuka dive bombers with fighter escorts. Kharkov was hit in a boiler room and taken in tow by Sposobny. But the German air attack was unrelenting. The last raid consisted of 25 Stukas with a large fighter escort. Soviet fighters arrived, but it was an uneven contest. Anti-aircraft guns and fighters managed to destroy 18 German aircraft, but all three Soviet destroyers were sunk. 780 sailors of the Black Sea Fleet were lost with them. This disaster caused the Stavka to prohibit any further surface raids in the Black Sea. From the conning tower of S-56, men peered anxiously towards the shore. Finally, they saw the signal. The submarine was there to land a reconnaissance team behind enemy lines. It was a frequent mission for Soviet submarines during the war. S-56, under Commander Shedrin, had travelled from Vladivostok more than halfway around the world via the Panama Canal to reach the Arctic Ocean. This 17,000-mile route was the only way to avoid major war zones and the winter ice. Northern Fleet submarines were also tasked with attacking convoys that brought supplies to Axis forces in northern Russia. On the 17th of May 1943, near the northern tip of Norway, S-56 sighted a convoy of one tanker, four cargo ships and eight escort vessels. Shedrin fired a salvo of four torpedoes. In one salvo, S-56 had sunk the tanker Eurostat, carrying 1,300 tons of fuel and damaged the steamer Vaterland. The attack was followed by a six-hour chase in which more than 60 depth charges were dropped, but none found their mark. 
As huge battles raged at Stalingrad and Kursk, in the north, the front remained static, and the battle to defend the Arctic convoys with their vital cargoes of military aid continued. The Soviet Northern Fleet fought a running battle against U-boats and the Luftwaffe into 1944. That year, a major development finally allowed the Soviet Baltic Fleet to break free of its shackles. In September 1944, Finland signed an armistice, allowing Soviet ships to bypass the net and mine defenses of the Gulf of Finland, and even operate from Finnish ports. In January 1945, the Red Army launched an offensive into East Prussia. The Germans began a massive operation to evacuate military personnel and equipment by sea. The ships also carried thousands of refugees. Amongst them was the Wilhelm Gustloff, a cruise ship requisitioned by the German Navy. On the 30th of January, she set sail from Gdynia amidst heavy snowfall and temperatures of minus 10. On board were 918 U-boat cadets, 500 other military personnel, and according to some estimates, as many as 9,000 refugees of whom nearly half were children. Fearing a collision with other convoys, the captain of the Wilhelm Gustloff turned on her navigation lights. It was these lights that led Commander Marinesco's S-13 to her shortly after 9 p.m. Marinesco stalked his quarry for more than an hour. Having got into a firing position, he launched four torpedoes. Three hit the liner with devastating consequences. More than 9,000 lives were lost on the Wilhelm Gustloff, but the Soviet Navy defended its right to attack a ship under escort carrying military personnel. Two weeks later, the same submarine sank the liner von Steuben with the loss of 4,000 lives. The majority of them in this case, wounded German soldiers. In the first months of 1945, the Red Army was advancing rapidly, crossing Poland to threaten Berlin in the north and crossing Hungary to reach Vienna in the south. But there were still pockets of German resistance along the Baltic coast in Pomerania and Latvia. Destroying these groups' communications by sea was the Baltic Fleet submarine's last mission of the war. Searchlights swept across the entrance to the Bay of Danzig. For the commander of Soviet submarine L-3, it was a discouraging sight. Commander Konovalov had orders to break into the bay, but he considered it a suicidal task. L-3 stood off at the bay's entrance. In early 1945, it was the scene of intense air and sea battles, particularly around the Hell Peninsula, as the Germans desperately tried to evacuate the remnants of their military forces and thousands of terrified refugees. But they had to run the gauntlet of Soviet submarines. On the 17th of April, 1945, L-3 sighted a convoy leaving the bay. It was bound from Hell to Sveinemunde. After dark, Konovalov attacked with three torpedoes. His victim was the transport ship Goya, carrying more than 6,000 passengers. There were just 183 survivors. In July 1945, Konovalov was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. His crew were also decorated. On the very first day of the war, the submarine L-3 had been at the mercy of the German Luftwaffe. 
It had only been spared because the Germans did not consider Soviet submarines to be a high enough priority. But they had gone on to prove themselves a truly deadly adversary. Today, the conning tower of L3 is on display at the Moscow Museum of the Great Patriotic War. The Soviet people celebrated Victory Day on the 9th of May, 1945. And on the 22nd of July, Soviet ships hoisted their colors to mark the first Navy Day since the end of the war. It was also marked by parades, and on this occasion, an address from Josef Stalin to all Soviet sailors. It read, The Navy has more than fulfilled its duty to the Soviet motherland. The sound of hammer blows echoed through the dark forest as German engineers worked hurriedly to repair the rail track. The Germans were nervous. They kept their weapons trained on the edge of the forest. In November 1942, the 6th Panzer Division was en route from France to reinforce the German army at Stalingrad. But the safety of its rail transports was a major concern for the Germans, even hundreds of miles behind the front. The division's commander was General Raus. The thing that most concerned me was to make sure that the units we were transporting could go straight into battle when they arrived. Therefore, in partisan areas, we proceeded with caution. Trains had to go slowly so they could break in time to avoid derailing on sabotage track. And there was the ever-present danger of an ambush. Rouse's division hadn't even reached the front yet, and already it was suffering its first casualties. On the 3rd of July, 1941, Stalin had made his first wartime radio broadcast to the Soviet people. Partisan detachments must be formed in areas occupied by the enemy to stir up guerrilla war everywhere, to blow up bridges and roads, sabotage telephone and telegraph lines, and to burn forests, stores and transports. 
We shall create intolerable conditions for the enemy and his supporters. They must be pursued and eliminated at every step. To organize the partisan war, a special unit was formed within Lavrenti Beria's NKVD secret police. Set up by Pavel Sudoplatov, the new unit was known as OMSPON, short for Independent Special Motorized Brigade. Its recruits included the best Soviet sportsmen. They would help to form the nucleus of sabotage groups which would be sent behind enemy lines. The recruits were sent to be trained at a new school for guerrilla warfare. Its students included an international battalion made up of hundreds of dedicated anti-fascists from Spain, Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. Just two weeks after Stalin's directive, the Wehrmacht issued orders to combat the threat from Soviet partisans. All Axis units were to maintain a state of constant alert. Soldiers were forbidden from walking alone. Weapons were to be kept on their person and ready for use at all times. In the 1930s, Soviet strategic planning had assumed that, in the event of war, the Red Army would attack and fight the war on enemy soil. So, caches of weapons and food to support a guerrilla war on home soil had been destroyed. For the same reason, they had stopped training experts in guerrilla warfare. In 1941, this infrastructure had to be hurriedly re-established. Until it was, what training partisans received, if any, came from Red Army officers, few of whom were specialists in guerrilla warfare. And crucially, hardly any partisan units were equipped with radios. Little or no training, absence of radio communication and lack of coordinated action meant that of 2,800 partisan units formed in the summer of 1941, only 270 lasted into 1942. In Ukraine in 1941, the NKVD claimed to have established 778 partisan units and 622 sabotage groups. Theoretically, they consisted of 29,000 personnel. By June 1942, just 110 of these units were still in contact. In the midst of such chaos, only partisans led by experienced commanders like Vasily Korsh proved successful. Vasily Zakharovich Korsh was a committed Belarusian communist who had fought as a partisan against Polish forces in the 1920s. He was also a decorated volunteer of the Spanish Civil War. When war broke out, Korsh immediately began organizing local resistance. And, just six days after the invasion, his partisans were the first to mount an attack against German troops. In May 1942, the central headquarters of the partisan movement was set up by the Stavka High Command. By November 1942, it recorded partisan strength as 90,000 personnel operating in 1,100 detachments. Central headquarters distributed 200 radio sets, which allowed it to communicate directly with the partisans to coordinate their actions and assign high priority targets. One such target was Rouse's 6th Panzer Division. Central headquarters had given the task of impeding its movement to two separate detachments, led by Saburov and Kovpak. Sidor Artimovich Kovpak was another experienced partisan leader who had his detachment up and running before the Germans arrived in his Ukrainian hometown in the summer of 1941. In 1943, his unit conducted the legendary Carpathian raid, sabotaging supply lines and wiping out isolated enemy garrisons in the course of a 600-mile advance to the Romanian border. While planning the war against the Soviet Union, Hitler had declared that the land was to be exploited to its fullest potential. 
The Wehrmacht's ultimate goal was a line running from Arkhangelsk in the north to Astrakhan in the south. Soviet territory was to be carved up into zones of occupation. Certain strategic areas, like the Crimea, would become part of a greater Germany. All was outlined in the top secret Generalplan Ost, Masterplan East. The plan spelled out a dark vision for Eastern Europe following the German victory over the USSR. It entailed a massive program of deportations, murder and enslavement of the native populations, followed by the colonization of the land by Germans and other racially acceptable peoples. All senior figures in the Third Reich became familiar with the Master Plan East. General Plan Ost, document number one, issued by SS Reichsführer Himmler on the 28th of May 1940. Top secret, national importance. On the 25th of May, I handed to the Führer a memorandum outlining my thoughts on the treatment of local populations in the occupied Eastern territories. The Führer read all six pages of my report, considered it correct, and warmly approved it. Most of those who escaped extermination were to be deported to Western Siberia. A minority, 10% of Poles, 25% of Belarusians, 35% of Ukrainians, were considered suitable for Germanization. Millions would be retained as slave labor. General Plan Ost would never be implemented, but those living under Nazi occupation still felt the effects of its brutal ideology. The Nazis planned to strip Eastern territories of all valuable resources. In 1941, special commissariats were established for the purpose. The special commissariat in Bielorussia was headed by Wilhelm Kuber. Wilhelm Kuber joined the Nazi party in the 1920s, when it was still on the fringe of German politics. He rose to become Gauleiter, or regional party leader, of Brandenburg. But he fell from favor after fabricating charges against a party rival. In June 1941, he was given a chance to redeem himself in Bielorussia. When the Germans moved into a town or village, they would appoint a burgomaster or village headman. Public notices printed in Russian listed their responsibilities. All burgomasters and village headmen are responsible for safety in their area. Should the locals fail to ensure this, at least twice the number of dead German soldiers will be taken from the local population and shot. In the event of damage being done to roads, bridges or mines, at least three local people will be shot. Those who give shelter or food to strangers or render them any assistance without permission of their burgomaster or village headman will be hanged. It didn't take long for the brutality of the new regime to be felt, driving a deep wedge between invaders and the occupied. In the first winter of the war, the Germans began to deport hundreds of thousands of workers to the Reich, where they were to be used as slave labor. One and a half million people, most of them Ukrainians, were transported to the Reich. More than half a million girls were sent to become domestic servants in German households. The treatment such workers were to receive was outlined by Fritz Sarkel. All these people must be fed, housed and treated in such a way that the greatest results are achieved with the minimum outlay. SS chief Heinrich Himmler put it even more starkly. If 10,000 Russian women collapse from exhaustion while digging an anti-tank ditch, it interests me only insofar that Germany at the end of it has an anti-tank ditch. At the Nuremberg trials, Fritz Sarkel was found guilty of crimes against humanity and hanged. Himmler escaped a similar fate by committing suicide. 
In the spring of 1942, local police came to the village of Yarmashinka near Smolensk, looking for men of working age. When they entered the Agorov household, 18-year-old Mikhail was out. The family had decided not to wait for the deportations to begin. They packed their belongings and headed for the forest to join the partisans. Из деревни мы. Сына моего немца забрать хотели. Возьмите нас к себе. They met a group of saboteurs in the forest. They were en route to the village of Selivoninka to blow up a bridge. Mikhail said he knew the way. Будем идти лесом через болото. On the 5th of May 1942, his 19th birthday, Mikhail Igorov was accepted into the special guerrilla regiment, codenamed the 13. Its commander was Sergei Grishin. Grishin began the war in a tank platoon. His unit became encircled during Operation Barbarossa, but Grishin escaped and returned to his home village to raise a partisan unit. It became Special Guerrilla Regiment the 13, named after Grishin's favorite action film by director Mikhail Rom. At dawn on the 13th of May 1942, the partisans walked 15 miles to attack the German garrison at Selivoninka. It was Mikhail Igorov's baptism of fire. Despite several local successes, the partisans failed to have any significant impact on the German supply chain. But the significance of their actions could be measured in other ways. Thousands of German soldiers, urgently needed at the front, had to be diverted to fight the partisans and protect supply routes. German morale began to suffer too. In the occupied territories, anyone could be on the side of the partisans. No one could be trusted. Any suspicious noise could turn out to be the start of a partisan attack. The partisans war at the nerves and resources of the German occupying forces. German reports state that of the 3.6 million Soviet prisoners of war they'd captured in 1941, by the spring of 1942, only 800,000 remained fit for work. 60% had been murdered or had died of starvation or disease. In the spring of 1942, thousands of Soviet prisoners of war sat or lay in the open at the Suwałki camp in Poland. They were given almost no food. Some had resorted to eating blades of grass. It was then that the former chief of staff of the 229th Rifle Division, Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Rodionov, decided to offer his services to the Nazis. He approached the Germans and offered to establish a fighting union of Russian nationalists. Their aim would be to overthrow Stalin's regime and establish a nationalistic Russian state under the protectorate of Germany. Rodionov's offer was taken up by the Nazi security service, the SD. Rodionov, who also used the alias Gil, was joined by a hundred former inmates of the Suwaki camp. They were issued with Czech military uniforms and became the first SS Russian volunteer detachment. The unit soon had 500 volunteers, most of whom were ex-Red Army officers. To prove their fighting ability and their loyalty, their first missions were conducted against Polish partisans. The detachment was later expanded to a brigade more than 2,000 strong. But despite the inhuman conditions, 
some prisoners remained steadfast. Nikolai Obrimba, a medic serving with a militia battalion, was taken prisoner in 1941 near Vitebsk. If you don't want to lose yourself in a desperate situation, you must purge your soul of doubts. Regardless of your feelings towards Stalin, there are two camps, two ideas, and two men leading those camps. And you shall support one idea, one camp, and one man embodying this idea. You shall hold on to the end, for otherwise neither death nor torture will justify you in your own eyes. By the spring of 1942, the partisans were operating on a much larger scale across occupied Bielorussia, Ukraine, and Western Russia. Soviet reports estimated 200,000 partisans were now operating behind German lines. Partisan units were especially active in the rear of German Army Group North and Army Group Center. They made their camps in the forest and marshland around Bryansk, Vitebsk, Smolensk, Novgorod, and Leningrad. A large partisan unit operated in the mountains of the Crimea. The organization and tactics of the partisans were refined. A partisan detachment was a self-sufficient unit consisting of 100 to 200 fighters. It had its own commander, political officer, and chief of staff. Each detachment had support and medical services and could be divided into several platoons. Several detachments formed a partisan brigade. Each brigade had its own hospital and workshops, which produced camouflaged capes, sheepskin jackets, and boots. A brigade could be a few hundred or a few thousand strong. The Belarusian brigade Dubova, for example, had 1,700 members. Several brigades formed a partisan group used for strategic operations. In some areas, the partisans drove out local German forces completely and established enclaves wholly under their control. Near Polatsk in northeastern Belarusia, the partisans set up their own schools, telephone lines, mills and workshops. They printed their own newspapers and pamphlets, which they distributed to the 80,000 civilians living within the enclave. They even opened an art gallery, which exhibited the work of partisans, including Nikolai Gutiev and Nikolai Obrimba, who had escaped from German captivity. Obrimba described what it meant to the partisans. The Dubova Brigade were proud of their paintings. That's why they put them in the headquarters, right next to the brigade's banner. We challenge the enemy. We can do anything, and our life doesn't depend on fear and death. We proclaim it for tomorrow and forever. The partisans could only operate with the help of the local population. Villagers brought them food and sometimes information which was vital to both their success and their survival. It required great courage on the part of the villagers. If they were caught by the Germans, not only they, but their whole communities might suffer brutal reprisals. On the 13th of May, 1943, 
Hitler signed the orders approving Operation Citadel, the Kursk Offensive. As if in reply, the partisans blew up both bridges over the river Desna near Bryansk, cutting the main supply route to the build-up area for the offensive. It took 12 days for German engineers to get both bridges back in action. This delay on the eve of the offensive was serious. If it happened again, at the height of the battle, it could be catastrophic. Therefore, in the weeks leading up to the Kursk offensive, the German high command ordered large-scale anti-partisan sweeps using frontline combat troops, including panzer regiments. The largest of these operations took place around Bryansk and was codenamed Operation Gypsy Baron. About 50,000 soldiers took part in the operation, including local collaborators. They faced several partisan brigades with a combined strength of approximately 11,000. The partisans were hindered by the fact that many women, old people and children had fled to the forest to join them. It made the partisans less mobile and less able to move their camp in a hurry. The Germans managed to separate the partisan brigades and drive them against the Desna River. The headquarters of the partisan movement took immediate steps to assist. They flew in weapons, ammunition and medical supplies and evacuated about 900 wounded partisans and others most at risk. Soviet aircraft bombed enemy troop concentrations, but partisan casualties mounted rapidly. They were outgunned and outnumbered. On the night of the 2nd of June, fierce fighting erupted at the Pionerski farm as the partisan detachments attempted to fight their way out of the trap. They succeeded, but at a heavy price. As soon as German regular units returned to the front, partisan detachments began to reform in the forest. That summer, Central Headquarters used radio to coordinate a massive partisan assault on the German rail network at the very height of the Battle of Kursk. It was codenamed Operation Rail War. There was one problem. To disrupt German rail transport on the scale envisaged would require thousands of tons of explosives, more than could be flown in by air. So the sabotage groups began to experiment. <laughs> Before the war, it was thought that between 200 and 400 grams of TNT were needed to destroy a rail track. But experiments with different rhomboid and trapezium-shaped charges showed that a rail track could be blown up with as little as 75 grams. This discovery reduced the quantity of explosives needed by more than half and made it an amount that could be delivered by air. Operation Rail War began on the night of the 3rd of August, 1943. Railways were blown up across Belorussia, Leningrad, Orel and Bryansk. But the results of Operation Rail War and Operation Concert that followed in September were disappointing. The Germans soon learned how to minimize any disruption. Trains traveled with their own track repair crews who would make quick temporary fixes to get the train moving again. Once the unit was passed, the rails could be replaced. Ilya Starinov, a famous Soviet saboteur questioned the wisdom of blowing up the tracks. He thought it was better to blow up the trains. But the rail war did have an impact. The head of transport for Army Group Center reported figures for August 1943. 
Partisan activities in August resulted in an average of 45 track demolitions per day and damage to 266 locomotives and 1,373 railroad cars. One of the partisans' greatest achievements during the Battle of Kursk was to blow up the Osipovichy railway station. The mission was carried out by special guerrilla detachment, the Brave Men, led by a colonel from Omspon, Alexander Rebtsevich. A Russian engineer working for the Germans managed to attach two magnetic mines to the fuel tanks. The explosion destroyed 33 fuel tankers, 65 ammunition wagons, eight Tiger tanks, seven armored vehicles, 12 food wagons, five locomotives, and the entire rail junction. The station was burning for two days. The partisans were 200 meters from the railway line. With the machine gun covering them, Mikhail Igorov and a comrade crawled quietly towards the railway embankment. Wooden barricades lined both sides of the track. They were hung with barbed wire and tin cans, which would rattle and alert the German sentries if anyone tried to sneak past. In the dark, working by touch, the partisans carefully cut away at the wire. A German patrol passed by. It took them an hour to cut their way through. Then they heard a train approaching. They rushed to the rails to plant the explosives. They buried the TNT, then tied a piece of string to the fuse pin and attached the other end to a ramrod. This they drove into the ground 50 centimeters away. The Germans put empty wagons at the front of the train, which would trigger a simple pressure mine and take the force of the blast. But this mine was different. The empty wagons passed harmlessly overhead, but the locomotive, whose running gear overhung the side of the track, knocked down the ramrod and pulled out the fuse pin. It was the latest example of ingenuity in a constantly evolving war between Soviet saboteurs and German transport officers. Soon, the Germans would devise a countermeasure and the saboteurs would have to think of something new. By the spring of 1944, Mikhail Igorov had derailed five trains and destroyed five bridges. He was awarded the Red Star Medal the Medal of Glory Third Class and the Partisan Medal First Class. According to statistics from the German General Directorate of Eastern Railways, Partisans carried out approximately 500 raids and acts of sabotage in February 1943, rising to 700 in April and to more than 1,000 per month in May and June. A derailed train blocked the line for about eight hours, so to bring movement to a complete halt required three derailings per day. This simple arithmetic was making life hell for the Germans. A kite soared 300 feet above the dark forests of Belarusia. Up towards it crept a little sail on wooden rollers. 
When it reached the kite, its cargo of leaflets was knocked loose and scattered across the forest below. Each leaflet was an appeal to the men of Lieutenant Colonel Rodionov's brigade of Russian nationalists, urging them to join with the partisans. In fact, many of these men had already begun to question their new allegiance after seeing the brutal way Germans treated their fellow Russians. Rodionov himself had been shocked at the way the Nazis were operating in the East. He had been promised an alliance. He now knew it was all lies. He sent a delegation to make contact with the partisans. Rodionov asked what guarantees the partisans could give for his own safety and that of his men. The partisans radioed Moscow. The reply came straight from General Ponomarenko, head of the central headquarters of the partisan movement. Командир, расшифровали сообщение. Дать гарантию усилить агитацию, использовав любую связь, в том числе личную переписку с Гиле Родионовым для разложения его бригад. Partisan leader Ivan Chetkov met with Rodionov. As a result, almost his entire brigade came over to the Soviet side. It was renamed the first anti-fascist partisan brigade. Within weeks, the brigade was in action against its former masters, attacking a German police garrison in the village of Stujunka. The partisans attacked at dawn with mortars and machine guns. By 7 a.m., they had stormed the village and wiped out the German garrison. For this successful operation, Rodionov was promoted to colonel and decorated with the Order of the Red Star. Many of the men in his unit went on to receive the Partisan of the Patriotic War medal. Meanwhile, General Commissar Wilhelm Kuber continued his brutal reign in Belarusia. In the summer of 1943, the NKVD intelligence department made his assassination a top priority. The task was assigned to all partisan units operating in the Minsk area. The hunt for Wilhelm Kuber was on. On the 22nd of July, a huge explosion tore through the Minsk theater. Soviet intelligence reported that 70 enemy soldiers had been killed and 110 wounded, but that Kuba had left the theater a few minutes before the explosion. Weeks later, a partisan unit ambushed Kuba on his way to his country residence, but he escaped again. The partisans suggested bombing Kuba's residence from the air, the mission was assigned to 15 crews from an elite long-range bomber unit. But Cuba survived once more and moved his residence into the city. On the 6th of September, a banquet was held in Minsk to mark the 10th anniversary of Hitler's rise to power. A bomb in the officers' mess killed 36 military and government officials, but Kuba wasn't there. Then, Yelena Mazanik, Kuba's housemaid, was contacted by partisan Maria Osipova. Maria told Yelena about the terrible crimes for which Kuba was responsible. She persuaded her to carry out an act of revenge and gave her a delayed action mine. On the morning of Tuesday, the 21st of September, Yelena Mazanik put the mine in her bag and went to work. Locals were always searched when entering the General Commissar's residence, but that day, Yelena was lucky. She knew the supervisor. The search was a formality. She went into Cuba's bedroom and put the mine underneath the mattress, below where his head would lie. Maria Osipova, Yelena Mazanik, and her sister Valentina were smuggled out of the city to a partisan safe house. 
That night, shortly before 1 a.m., General Commissar Wilhelm Kuber was asleep in his Minsk residence when the mine exploded. The mine that killed Cuba had a directional force that ensured it only killed its target. Neither Cuba's pregnant wife nor his children sleeping in the next room were harmed. By the beginning of 1944, Soviet records showed 300,000 partisans under arms. There were nearly 150 radio sets in use in Bielorussia alone. The partisans now had a dedicated air unit, the 101st Long Range Aviation Regiment, which flew 20 missions to the partisans every night. In the spring of 1944, the Germans planned a massive operation to destroy the partisan enclave near Polatsk in northern Bielorussia. They deployed 60,000 soldiers, 137 tanks, 236 guns, 70 aircraft and two armoured trains. 60,000 partisans and civilians found themselves encircled by units of the German 3rd Panzer Army, which quickly seized control of all their airfields. So the partisans built a new one on a hill in the middle of the marshes. Наша задача построить взлётную полосу. Тяжело будет. The partisans needed to fill the bog with soil to make a strip at least 1000 meters long. Logs were laid first, then tightly packed brushwood, and then soil on top. 2,000 peasants from the local village, supervised by Nikolai Obrimba, worked on the strip for three weeks. Pits were dug for fires to act as landing lights. Carpenters made hatches with iron bottoms. To put the light out quickly, you pulled a rope tied to the prop that held up the hatch. To support the partisans, the Soviet Air Force carried out 354 missions. These included bombing raids against German positions, ferrying in 250 tons of supplies, and evacuating about 1,500 casualties. But the pressure from heavily armed German troops was relentless. At the end of April, the surviving partisans attempted to break out. At first, partisan brigades tried to coordinate their actions with the army high command, but communications broke down, and each unit had to fight its own way out as best it could. By the 27th of April, the Germans had forced the last partisans into a pocket just 20 kilometers wide. The local commander ordered the survivors to break out at all costs, and eight days later, they succeeded in leading 15,000 civilians to safety. At the forefront of the fighting was Colonel Rodionov's first anti-fascist brigade. During his service with the German security forces, Rodionov had led his brigade in punitive actions against Belarusian civilians and had taken part in the destruction of five villages along the Berezina River. Now, Rodionov atoned for these crimes with his own blood. During the breakout, Rodionov was killed while persuading his soldiers to stand up and attack the enemy. His remains were rediscovered in 1992 and reburied in a communal grave for partisans in the town of Uschachi. One month after the fall of the partisan enclave, the Red Army launched Operation Bagration. Soviet regular forces drove the enemy from all parts of Belarusia. Many partisans joined the ranks of the Red Army. In the small hours of the 1st of May 1945, one former partisan, Mikhail Egorov, alongside Sergeant Meliton Kantaria, was in the heart of Berlin, climbing to the very top of the Reichstag building. Egorov had brought a sack containing the assault banner of the 756th Rifle Regiment of the 150th Rifle Division. They were covered by their commanding officer, Lieutenant Alexei Berest.
Behind Mikhail Agorov lay two years of the deadly partisan war, a serious shoulder wound, and service as a Red Army infantry scout in Poland and Germany. Ahead lay a few steps to the roof of the Reichstag and to victory. The 21st of June, 1941, Moscow. An express train from Berlin arrived at the Bieloruski terminal. On board was Mikhail Vorontsov, naval attaché at the Soviet embassy in Berlin. He was taking no chances with his briefcase. Two days before, Vorontsov had received a high-priority telegram from Moscow, ordering his immediate return. An escort arrived to meet him on the platform. An official from the Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, accompanied by two officers of the NKVD secret police. A government car pulled up outside. Vorontsov was ushered onto the back seat between the two policemen. He could relax for the first time since leaving Berlin. His precious briefcase was now someone else's concern. Mikhail Alexandrovich Vorontsov fought with the Bolsheviks in the Russian Civil War before joining the Naval Academy. After graduation, he was sent to the Far East, where he rose to become Deputy Chief of Staff of the Pacific Fleet. In 1939, he was sent to Berlin as the Soviet naval attaché. <laughs> The driver stopped outside the Spaskaya Tower, the entrance to the Kremlin. Ten minutes later, Mikhail Vorontsov entered Stalin's office. Amongst the documents he'd brought from Berlin was a copy of a message he'd been given by the Swedish naval attaché. The document was headed, Official Inquiry from Berlin, regarding the routes of Swedish ships and aircraft in the Baltic Sea after the 22nd of June 1941, to avoid engaging them during war with the USSR. Soviet intelligence work was carried out both legally, by agents traveling under Soviet passports, and illegally, by agents with forged documents. Foreign intelligence work was carried out by networks known as residencies. Each member of a residency, whether working legally or illegally, had a specialized role. One agent recruited and managed local agents. Another was responsible for radio communications. Another acted as courier of secret or stolen documents. And the resident himself oversaw all the group's operations. 
In the early 1920s, Soviet intelligence began to establish legal and illegal residencies across Europe. After 1933 and Hitler's rise to power in Germany, it became clear which country posed the greatest threat to the Soviet Union. Therefore, many Soviet agents were reassigned to Nazi Germany to gather information on the country's military potential and its intentions. After war broke out in 1939, the number of illegal Soviet residencies in Germany increased by 50%. Similar networks were active in Belgium, the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, Japan, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. Military intelligence residencies worked legally in many of the same countries. Each agent had a cover job at the Soviet embassy or with some other Soviet delegation. The agent might be a diplomatic official, a chauffeur, or a technical expert. In June 1941, the military intelligence central office employed 914 people abroad, 316 of whom worked as part of legal residencies, and 598 of whom were illegal agents. Even Stalin knew most of these men only by their code names. He himself had enough experience of working in the underground to know that the more times an agent's name was mentioned, the greater the danger he faced. From the autumn of 1940, an increasing number of reports began to warn about the build-up of German forces along the Nazi Soviet frontier in Poland. Soviet military intelligence desperately sought the answer to the questions, would Hitler attack, and, if so, when? The incoming reports offered many different dates for a German invasion of the USSR. Initially, it was supposed to take place in March or April 1941. Then new reports said it had been postponed to the summer, but depended on Britain's surrender. Then there was fresh information that it had been postponed until 1942. The situation was further complicated by the fact that only one person knew Hitler's exact intentions, Adolf Hitler himself. He only signed the order authorizing Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, on the 10th of June 1941, 12 days before it was launched. On the 18th of June, Moscow began to receive reports from agents on the frontier that German military units were preparing for something big. It was clearly no longer a matter of months or weeks, but of days. But despite the growing warnings, Soviet intelligence failed to produce anything, even Vorontsov's Swedish telegram, that could persuade Stalin that war was imminent. In just a few weeks, Vorontsov would be promoted to Chief of Staff of Naval Intelligence, and by September, he would be its commander. It was a job he would hold for more than 10 years, but he would inherit an intelligence service rendered blind and deaf by the sudden German invasion. Operation Barbarossa had begun, and despite all the warnings, the Soviet Union was not prepared. In the first days of the war, all Soviet legal residencies in Germany, in the countries of her allies, and in countries occupied by the Axis were terminated, and all embassy workers were deported back to the Soviet Union. Soviet military intelligence lost contact with its agents in 11 European countries. The agents themselves remained at large, but if they couldn't contact Moscow, 
they were of little use. A similar situation occurred with intelligence networks that had been established along the frontiers. As the German army swept forwards, contact with most of these agents was lost until the end of the war. Soviet agents working abroad did not have access to enough radio sets or skilled operators. The radio equipment they did have was bulky and unreliable. There was even a shortage of radio batteries. The range of these radio sets was no more than 600 miles, which meant their signal could only reach the Western Soviet Union. It wasn't strong enough to reach Moscow, let alone Koibyshev, where military intelligence headquarters had been moved to. The codes and encryption keys used by Soviet intelligence at the start of the war were complex and difficult to work with. It took a long time to encode and decode even the simplest message. Radio transmissions could also be picked up by German counterintelligence, who patrolled the cities with direction finding equipment to locate illegal transmitters. Direction finding used directional antennae to establish the source of a radio signal. By the mid-1930s, it was in use by most counterintelligence services. Three vans equipped with mobile directional antennae would patrol a city looking for unusual radio transmissions. They would triangulate their findings to pinpoint the exact location of the radio transmitter. Once the exact building was identified, police units would surround it, force their way in, and arrest the operator. German counter-espionage made it almost impossible for Soviet agents to communicate directly with Moscow. Communication with most Soviet pre-war agents was only re-established in 1945, as the Red Army advanced into Eastern Europe. Improvised lines of communication, often using couriers, were used to deliver the most important information. But while couriers could move across Europe with ease in peacetime, during the war it was a different matter. They not only ran the risk of being arrested by the Gestapo, but also of being killed in attacks on ships, trains and roads. In Japan and China, Soviet agents remained active. A few illegal residencies continued to operate in occupied France, Belgium and Holland. Soviet intelligence remained highly effective in the USA, the UK and in neutral Sweden and Switzerland. July 1941, Stockholm. Three weeks into the German-Soviet war. From the outside, the fish warehouse near the docks of the Swedish capital looked like any other building in the area. But this one harbored a secret. It was the home of the code and cipher department of the general staff of the Swedish armed forces. Alain Nieblad, a Swedish war ministry courier, was considered a master of his trade. The general staff trusted him with their most urgent and important papers. He was a stickler for the rules and would only ever hand his package to the exact person to whom it was addressed. It annoyed a lot of people, but the war minister was impressed by his punctilious courier. What none of the Swedish authorities knew was that Nieblad was a secret communist and Soviet agent. To make it easier for the couriers to get around town, 
Their bicycles carried special license plates. This meant they wouldn't be stopped by the local police. One day, after receiving a package addressed to the general staff, Alan Nieblad set off on his bike through the quiet Stockholm streets, but then took an unexpected turn down a deserted alley and dismounted. After checking the coast was clear, he took off his special license plate and replaced it with an ordinary one. He arrived at a two-story house and went in. Semyon Storistin worked officially for a Russian tourist agency. He also worked for Soviet military intelligence. Semyon Kuzmich Storistin, codenamed Kent, joined Soviet military intelligence in 1937 and was sent to Scandinavia in 1939. His cover story included a job as director of the Russian tourist agency In Tourist in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, as well as a representative of Aeroflot, the Soviet state airline. In November 1941, he returned to the USSR when one of his agents was captured. When all the documents had been photographed, Staristin put the papers in a new envelope. Rubber stamps from numerous Swedish institutions were at his disposal. The value of this intelligence was enormous. Thanks to Kent, Moscow received daily reports on enemy movements along the entire Eastern Front, because the Swedes were listening in on the Germans and had broken their codes. In 1940, Sweden had suspected Germany of planning to occupy the country. Stockholm set out to uncover Hitler's intentions. Swedish maths professor Arne Berling, working alone with just pad and pencil, was able to crack German military and diplomatic ciphers in just two weeks. It allowed the Swedes to intercept and decode German cable traffic. And what the Swedes saw now also went to Moscow. In January 1942, Nieblad was picked up by the Swedes and sentenced to 12 years hard labor. But by then, Moscow had information on how the Swedes had broken the German encryption. In June, when the Germans were tipped off that the Swedes were listening in, Soviet cryptographers were able to decipher the new German codes themselves. The 18th of October, 1941, Tokyo. The Japanese Empire and the Soviet Union observed an uneasy peace, but tension remained high. At dawn, Japanese counter-espionage launched an operation to smash an illegal Soviet spy network. One of the men they arrested that morning was Richard Zorge, the group's resident. As he was led away under heavy guard, a thorough search was made of his flat. The Japanese found incriminating documents, cameras, and a photostat copying machine. When they searched the house of Max Clausen, the group's radio operator, they found his transmitter and his code books. Richard Zorge, also known by codenames Sonter, Schwarz, Ramsey, and Insen, was born in Tsarist Russia, but as a boy moved with his family to Germany. After fighting for Germany in the First World War, Zorge became an ardent communist and moved to Moscow. There, he was recruited by Soviet military intelligence and sent back to Germany to build a cover story as a journalist and Nazi sympathizer. It served him well 
until October 1941, when he was arrested by the Japanese. They hanged him three years later. In 1964, he was posthumously awarded the state's highest award, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. Sorge's network included 32 Japanese agents, four Germans, two Yugoslavians, and one Briton. They included German radio operator Bruno Wendt and his successor Max Klaassen, Manchester Guardian journalist Gunter Stein, Yugoslavian journalist Branko Vukelic, Japanese journalist Miyagi Yotoku, and Japanese journalist Hotsumi Ozaki, an advisor to the Japanese Prime Minister. Another valuable source for the group was Eugen Ott, German ambassador to Japan and confidant of Richard Sorge. Sorge's arrest and the dismantling of his Tokyo network was a bitter blow to Soviet intelligence. He had been an invaluable source on Japanese and German intentions in the Far East. Sorge's greatest coup had been to establish that Japan did not intend to attack the Soviet Union in 1941, as Stalin feared. He sent a telegram from Tokyo in September. According to the secretary of the cabinet, Ozaki, the Japanese government has decided to take no action against the USSR this year. But armed forces will remain stationed in Manchuria for a possible attack next spring if the USSR is defeated by Germany. After the 15th of September, the Soviet Far East can be considered safe from the threat of a Japanese attack. This vital information came as the Germans made their final push on Moscow. It allowed the Stavka High Command to rush 32 divisions from Siberia and the Far East to help defend the capital. On the 5th of December, 1941, these divisions spearheaded a massive counterattack that threw the Germans back from the gates of Moscow. It was a crucial victory, which owed much to Richard Zorge. Soviet military intelligence also had its eyes and ears in Washington. From there, too, news reached Moscow about Japanese intentions in 1941. Lev Sergeyev worked at the Soviet embassy as the military attache's driver. He was also an intelligence agent, codenamed Morris. All that summer, he sent messages to Moscow stating that Japan had no plans to attack the USSR. 16th of July, 1941, Morris to Moscow. The attitude of Japan towards the USSR is wait and observe. February 1942, Berlin. The head of the German military intelligence service, the Abwehr, was a man named Admiral Wilhelm Canaris. That spring, he was in low spirits. Hitler blamed Canaris for not providing accurate information on the size of Soviet reserves and for allowing the Wehrmacht to be caught off guard by the Soviet counterattack that winter. This, and the weather, was how the German generals explained their failure. Admiral Wilhelm Canaris became head of the Abwehr in 1933. He was a dedicated anti-communist, which is why he initially gave his support to Hitler and the Nazis. But by 1938, he'd become convinced that Hitler would lead Germany to ruin. He began to actively conspire against the Fuhrer, and in 1942 established a secret line of communication to British intelligence. The SS had its suspicions about Canaris, and he was dismissed from his post in February 1944. He was arrested following the July bomb plot against Hitler and hanged in a concentration camp one month before the end of the war. As an anti-communist, Canaris still had a vested interest in the war against the Soviet Union. But the Abwehr failed to provide the Army High Command with an accurate estimate of Soviet military strength in the run-up to the German invasion. They also failed to place any agents within the Soviet High Command. The NKVD was extremely adept at exposing enemy agents. 
Numerous Soviet prisoners of war were recruited as spies by the Abwehr and smuggled back across the lines. But almost all of them disappeared into the vast Russian hinterland. Some turned themselves in, some were picked up by the NKVD, others simply went home. Very few of these agents made it back, and their reports contained little of value. Canaris's mood improved in December 1941, when he received an unexpected report from the intelligence chief of Army Group Center. There exists in Moscow an underground anti-Soviet organization called The Throne. It is attempting to spread anti-Soviet feeling amongst the people. The leaders are Sadovsky, a royalist and poet, and his wife, a former lady-in-waiting to the Tsarina. One of its members, Demyanov, the grandson of a Cossack chief and former noble, risked his life crossing the front line to tell us about the existence of the throne. During his interrogation, Demyanov claimed to have been in contact with German intelligence since 1940. His contact had been a man named Stotz. After his story was rigorously vetted, Demyanov was given a code name, Max, and sent back to the Soviet Union. Max's mission was to organize underground anti-Soviet cells in major cities, to orchestrate a campaign of sabotage, and to establish a network for gathering information about the movement of Red Army forces. Most importantly, Max was to use his contacts in the Soviet General Staff and the Ministry of Transport to find out about military movements by rail. At the end of the war, Richard Kauder, an officer of the Abwehr, was captured by the Americans. During one of his interrogations, he told them that in 1942 and 43, Max supplied valuable information that was often passed on to the Wehrmacht High Command. The Germans believed that Demyanov had infiltrated the Soviet general staff as a junior signals officer. Kauder further claimed that the throne had set up several cells in Moscow and Gorky, which communicated directly with the Abwehr in Berlin. They did this using three transmitters supplied to them by the Germans. And all of this, it seemed, under the noses of the famed Soviet counter-espionage services. The Germans did not discover until after the war that this underground anti-Soviet organization had been created by the NKVD. Soviet intelligence had meticulously created plausible anti-Soviet agents, which they then used to infiltrate the Abwehr. These agents then fed the enemy misinformation. It was called Operation Monastery. Since the 1930s, the poet Boris Sadovsky had been used by the NKVD as bait to trick opponents of the regime into revealing their anti-Soviet sentiments. On three occasions, the secret police had arrested his associates, but the poet himself always remained free. Alexander Demyanov was a former noble who became an NKVD agent in 1929. He infiltrated German intelligence in 1942 and even received specialist training from the Abwehr. He was later awarded the Order of the Red Star for his exceptional service in Operation Monastery. Meanwhile, German intelligence continued its attempts to recruit Soviet prisoners of war. From the spring of 1942, Canaris's agents brought him regular reports about the progress made with former soldiers of the Red Army. German intelligence was well versed in techniques for turning Soviet citizens against Stalin and Soviet communism. The Admiral hoped that these recruits would provide valuable intelligence, but he would be disappointed once again. October 1942, Poltava, occupied Ukraine. 
At the intelligence school of Abwehr Group 102, former Soviet soldiers were listening to a lecture on how to gather military secrets whilst operating behind enemy lines. The door opened and the head of the school walked in. This Deutsch? Ich weiß, niemand von euch glaubt, dass man aus dem russischen Hinterland halt zurückkommt. Es ist nicht wahr. Hier kommt ein Held. Er war dreimal im russischen Hinterland, um gegen den verhassten Stalin zu kämpfen. Перед вами герой. Он сам перешел линию фронта, чтобы воевать против ненавистного Сталина. Он три раза побывал в советском тылу. Друзья. What no one in the Abwehr knew was that Pyotr Priadko, former depot commander of the Soviet 5th Army, had infiltrated German military intelligence under the orders of the NKVD. All the information he was giving them was in fact misinformation, prepared in Moscow. Priadko's role in Abwehr Group 102 was to forge papers for the students. He always made small mistakes that would ensure the agent was arrested when his papers were properly examined. His misinformation also succeeded in compromising several high-ranking German intelligence officers who were dismissed from their posts. Priadko sent back information on 101 agents working for the Germans and 24 members of the Abwehr. In December 1942, he rejoined the Red Army. He was subsequently awarded the Order of the Red Banner for his courage and heroism. Over the course of the war, the Abwehr was infiltrated by hundreds of Soviet agents. They gathered information about the enemy and planted false information about the Red Army and its intentions. They had effectively succeeded in turning Germany's own intelligence services into its high command's biggest source of enemy misinformation. Thirteenth of September, 1943, Paris. A car carrying two passengers drove up to a pharmacist's shop on Rome Street. One man left the car and went in. After a few moments, the other man went in too. The man on the run was Leopold Trepper, a Soviet agent who'd agreed to work for the Germans two weeks before. But now he'd given his Abwehr handlers the slip. The furious Germans launched a city-wide manhunt. As early as 1938, Trepper had established a powerful Soviet intelligence network across Belgium, the Netherlands, France and Italy. It had about 300 members, and Trepper was its head until his arrest by the Abwehr in November 1942. Through his group, the Soviets also received intelligence from Rudolf Rösler. Rudolf Rösler, codenamed Lucy, was one of the most valuable agents of the Second World War. A German refugee living in Switzerland, he began working for Soviet intelligence for ideological reasons. He supplied the Soviets with vital information about the German Kursk offensive of 1943. Rösler's own source, codenamed Werther, remains a mystery. At the Nuremberg trials, Alfred Jodl of the German Armed Forces High Command said that information about the Kursk offensive reached Moscow before it reached his own desk. After the war, Rosler continued to feed the USSR information gathered in West Germany, leading to his arrest and a year in a Swiss prison. He died soon after his release in 1958. 
After Trepper's arrest, German counterintelligence succeeded in shutting down most of his networks. In Berlin, they referred to Soviet radio operators as pianists. Trepper's network involved at least 10 pianists, hence the nickname, the Red Orchestra. German counterintelligence was able to force some of the Red Orchestra's former radio operators, including Trepper himself, to start feeding misinformation to Moscow. Admiral Canaris had made a breakthrough. The Soviets did not only believe the misinformation, they asked for more. After his escape, Trepper, with the help of French communists, managed to get word to Moscow that his network had been compromised. The information coming in from its former radio operators was finally seen for what it was. November 1944. Two Soviet agents were conducting round-the-clock surveillance on the Norwegian coast. Twelve hours later, a staff officer entered the office of the Chief of Naval Intelligence, Mikhail Voronsov. Самолет-разведчик подтвердил нахождение корабля в квадрате. Тирпец обнаружен. Англичане три года не могут его потопить. Дадим союзникам еще один шанс. The Tirpitz was one of the few remaining threats posed by the German Navy. She'd played little direct part in the war so far, but her presence in Norway threatened the Arctic convoys to the Soviet Union and tied down a significant number of British warships. The sister ship of the Bismarck, she might still prove a formidable adversary. On the 12th of November 1944, British Lancaster bombers, carrying five-ton Tallboy bombs, set off for the Norwegian fjord of Tromsø. The Germans had no warning of the raid. The Luftwaffe was nowhere to be seen. Two of the huge bombs hit the port side of the Tirpitz, blowing a massive hole in the ship's hull. As water poured in, she took on a heavy list and capsized. The destruction of the Tirpitz at Tromsø cost the lives of 1,000 of her 1,700-man crew. It was a final nail in the coffin of Hitler's navy. Since the summer of 1941, the Soviets had had their spies in Norway, including units gathering intelligence for the Soviet Northern Fleet. They also recruited agents from the local population and worked with the Norwegian resistance. Some Norwegian agents were sent to a Soviet training camp near Murmansk, where they were given basic instruction in radio communications and intelligence gathering. The agents were then sent back to Norway by submarine. 
After nightfall, they would be landed on a secluded stretch of coastline. Groups would also be resupplied and finally extracted by submarine. The agent's orders were to observe German fortifications, troop movements and military supply depots. They were also ordered to find German warships hidden in the Norwegian fjords and transmit this information back to Murmansk. Soviet and British air forces were able to use this intelligence to make raids against valuable German targets in Norway and Finland. Following Germany's surrender in May 1945, for most, the celebrations could begin. But there was no let-up for the secret services. It was clear that in Washington and London, the rise of Soviet power aroused great mistrust. Mutual suspicion came to the fore. Now the common enemy had been defeated. In April 1945, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered his military staff to investigate the feasibility of an attack against the Soviet Union, codenamed Operation Unthinkable. The study was conducted by the British Armed Forces Joint Planning Staff. Their report envisaged a scenario in which 47 British and American divisions fighting alongside Polish forces and 12 rearmed German divisions launched a surprise attack against the Red Army in northwest Europe. The planning staff concluded that Britain would have to commit to a long and costly war, and that, even so, the prospect of success was extremely doubtful. In his comments on the plan, Churchill stated that it was a precautionary measure for a highly hypothetical situation. On the 18th of May, 1945, the Soviet military attaché in London, Major General Ivan Sklerov, passed information on the top secret Operation Unthinkable to Moscow. Sklerov's source was an Agent X, whose identity to this day remains a mystery. Over the next few weeks, this same agent was able to pass Sclair off more details about Operation Unthinkable, including the size of British and American forces involved. In June 1945, Marshal Zhukov received details of the plan and immediately regrouped Soviet forces in eastern Germany. He issued orders for the Red Army to strengthen its defences and to closely observe the Western Allied forces. Churchill knew British and American forces were outnumbered by the Red Army. More importantly, he knew that there was neither the public nor political will for such a war in 1945. The Americans were more interested in getting Soviet help in the war against Japan. Operation Unthinkable remained just that. In July 1945, during the Potsdam Conference, American President Harry Truman as agreed with the British Prime Minister, mentioned to Stalin that the US had developed a new weapon of unusually destructive force. Truman was surprised by the reaction of the Soviet leader. A few minutes later, as they waited for their cars, Churchill asked Truman how it had gone. He never asked a question, replied the President. The British and American leaders assumed simply that Stalin had failed to understand the significance of what he was being told. But they were mistaken. Since 1942, Soviet intelligence had been gathering information on the Allies' atomic bomb program. More than 10 agents were feeding information to the Soviets. Thanks to their efforts, the USSR tested its first atomic bomb as early as 1949. In February 1945, in a letter to Truman's predecessor, President Roosevelt, Joseph Stalin had even hinted at the effectiveness of Soviet intelligence. 
As to my informers, I assure you they are all very honest and modest people who carry out their duties carefully and without giving offense. These people have proven themselves by their deeds many times. An unexpected guest fell down into a German trench. The NCO, a seasoned veteran of the Eastern Front, immediately took note of the deserter's cap. There was no customary red star on it. The man was from a punishment battalion. During his interrogation, the deserter told the Germans about the coming Soviet offensive. The man's punishment battalion had been due to attack in the first wave. He had become convinced that he would not survive. The German high command took the deserters' information seriously. The Vistula Front in central Poland had stabilized by the autumn of 1944. Weeks passed, but the expected Red Army offensive did not materialize. German forces were withdrawn from Poland for a counterattack in the Ardennes. The 4th SS Panzer Corps was pulled out of Warsaw and sent to Hungary. The front defending the road to Berlin had been stripped bare. But the Soviet offensive had only been postponed. The fact that the Feind nicht zum Angriff kommt, wird durch das Wetter verursacht. Er braucht Frost und gute Durchsichtigkeit, damit er seine Flugzeuge verwenden kann. The German units in Poland had been rehearsing new tactics to counter the initial Red Army onslaught. The initial Soviet artillery barrage would often wipe out German units holding the front line of trenches. So the Germans decided that, at the last moment, they would withdraw the infantry to the second line, two to three kilometers to the rear. Every three to 500 meters, they dug communication trenches connecting the two lines. 
the Soviet bombardment would fall on empty trenches, while the infantry prepared to meet the Soviet assault from the second line. Most of the barbed wire and obstacles were placed between the first and second lines. The Germans prepared to fall back at any moment. Behind them, panzer divisions, including the new King Tigers, were ready to counterattack. Soviet intelligence had severely underestimated the strength of the enemy's reserves. The Wehrmacht was preparing to fight for Germany. They would bleed their enemies white and force them to accept peace on their terms. A new Soviet trick was to play loud music from the trenches. It drowned out the noise of tanks and gun tractors as they moved up for the attack. Finally, on the 12th of January, they put on a new record. Through the grey dawn and across the snow-covered plain came the sound of an unbreakable union of freeborn republics. The national anthem of the USSR. As the last words of the anthem faded, there was a short pause, and then the roar of hundreds of guns. German infantry streamed back through the communication trenches. The first shells landed as the Germans were still falling back to the second line. They expected a long bombardment of the forward trenches, but it was only a short barrage. By the time the infantry reached their new positions, the Soviet guns were pummeling the second line with all their remaining ammunition. The German army's new defensive tactics had failed on this occasion. But the German command still had its armoured reserve. At Kielce, a German heavy tank battalion with 72 Tigers and King Tigers launched its counterattack. By early 1945, most Soviet tank regiments had been re-equipped with the new T-34-85. This tank had a much more powerful, long-barreled 85mm gun. It gave the crews a much better chance against heavily armoured German tanks like the Tiger and Panther. At Lysov, the Tigers were ambushed by the Soviet 61st Guards Tank Brigade. After a ferocious battle, the Tiger Battalion was defeated. Around Kielce, the Germans counterattacked with more than 350 tanks and self-propelled guns, but they failed to halt the advance of two Soviet tank armies. The German panzer divisions were encircled and destroyed. Other counterattacks by German armored units at Puava and Magnushev were also unsuccessful. On the 17th of January 1945, the Red Army entered Warsaw. A giant breach had been made in the German front line. Red Army tanks advanced so fast that they overran airfields where German aircraft were still being refueled. Near Lublin, 
they captured 60 Luftwaffe aircraft at one airfield. But in East Prussia, the third Bielorussian front had less success. Here, intelligence work proved much more difficult. The local German population was fiercely hostile. Many reconnaissance patrols never returned from their mission. Reconnaissance failed to detect the withdrawal of German forces, so the artillery bombardment did fall on empty frontline trenches. The Germans were falling back to Königsberg. The Soviet Air Force had been grounded by blizzards and was unable to support the attack. Fifteen days into the offensive, the second Ukrainian front approached the grey huts of the Auschwitz concentration camp, surrounded by its guard towers and electrified fences. Auschwitz was, in fact, a network of more than 40 camps, of which Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest. The rapid advance of the Red Army forced the Germans to hurriedly shut down operations at this factory of death. Himmler issued orders for the camp to be liquidated. Surviving prisoners were to be evacuated or killed, and all the apparatus of extermination was to be demolished with dynamite. 60,000 emaciated prisoners were marched away on foot. Amongst them was Soviet partisan Irina Karina. We walked, column after column, guarded by SS men and surrounded by dogs. The snow was soaked with blood. It was pink, because anyone who fell behind, tripped or stopped, was shot on the spot. The last crematorium was blown up 24 hours before the Red Army arrived. At the last minute, the SS shot around 700 prisoners, hoping to silence the last witnesses. But in their rush to escape the approaching Soviet tanks, the SS failed to carry out all its tasks. The Red Army found 7,500 starved prisoners inside the camp, and enough evidence to work out what had happened there. They found mountains of personal belongings taken from the dead. The victims at this camp alone, 90% of them Jews, numbered 1.1 million. As the Red Army advance continued, the first Ukrainian front under Marshal Ivan Konyev met determined resistance around the industrial region of Silesia. So he chose another approach. To drive the enemy from this vast sprawl of factories and plants would cost men and time, and Stalin wanted the factories intact. He described this region to Marshal Konyev as pure gold, and so, with the agreement of the general staff, Konyev allowed the Germans to escape from Silesia. A corridor six kilometers wide was left open to the south, through which the Germans withdrew. By the end of January, the entire region was under Soviet control. When Albert Speer, Hitler's Minister of Armaments, sent the Führer a memorandum on the significance of the loss of Silesia, it began with the words, the war is lost. After the destruction of the Ruhr industries by Allied bombing, Silesian mines provided 60% of German coal. With the loss of Silesia, 1945's coal output would be one quarter of the previous years, and her steel output just one sixth. Speer continued. With the loss of Silesia, German industry will not be able to meet the front's requirement for ammunition, weapons and tanks. It meant defeat within the year. 
But this information was kept within Hitler's inner circle. Hitler continued to demand self-sacrifice and fanatical resistance from his followers. To salvage the disastrous situation on the Eastern Front, he turned to one of his oldest allies, SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler. Hitler appointed him head of the newly formed Army Group Vistula, despite his total lack of experience of military command. One man who was appalled by this decision was the talented Panzer General Heinz Guderian, now chief of the Army General Staff. Guderian, knowing Himmler would need all the help he could get, appointed Walter Wenck, an experienced staff officer, as his chief of staff. Hitler gave this role to Himmler because he believed only a true Nazi could instill the troops with the necessary fanaticism to defeat the enemy. It was an illustration of how far the Fuhrer had become detached from reality. Soviet tank crews walked amongst snow-covered aircraft at the Poznania airfield. Dozens of Heinkel 111s grounded by lack of fuel. The days of the Third Reich were numbered. But the German garrison of Poznania was in no hurry to surrender. The commander of the first tank army, General Katukov, soon found that the city was a tank crew's worst nightmare. Narrow streets and well-prepared killing zones. Katukov was authorized to continue the advance to Berlin. Poznanyi would be left to General Chuikov, the hero of Stalingrad, and his 8th Guards Army. Chuikov's orders were to take Poznanyi by storm. It lay in a crucial position at the heart of the local road and rail network. Chuikov's troops began their assault on the 26th of January. Chuikov left an escape route open to the west. He hoped the Germans would withdraw so he could take the city quickly and at minimal cost. But the besieged garrison made no attempt to break out. This was a real fortress, held by 20,000 Germans behind three-meter-thick stone walls. Soviet artillery pounded away at the city's 18th-century fortifications to limited effect. Hitler had advocated the fortress or Festung strategy in 1943. It meant holding designated fortresses at all costs, even after they had become completely cut off. In Ukraine and Belarusia, the strategy found little support amongst his generals. But by 1945, as the fighting reached German soil, fewer generals were willing to stand up to the Führer. A Festung that held important road and rail junctions made it difficult for the Red Army to resupply its forward units. On the other hand, the strategy meant valuable German units became trapped and isolated. The second assault on Poznanyi began on the 28th of January. Chuikov preceded it with an ultimatum to the garrison. I, General Chuikov, propose that you lay down your arms and surrender. I guarantee your life and that you will return home after the war. Otherwise, you will be destroyed. Few of the defenders took up the offer. The garrison commander, Major General Gonel, was a dedicated Nazi. He had no intention of surrendering. Meanwhile, Katukov's tanks had bypassed Poznanyi and were heading west towards Berlin. But at the old Polish-German border, they encountered the Ostwall, 
the East Wall. The Ostwall was an old fortified line, which Germany had begun building along its border with Poland in 1934. But in 1938, Hitler decided that these defences were no longer a priority and halted further work on the line. In 1944, as the Red Army closed in, the fortifications were hurriedly prepared for action. The line was composed of a series of redoubts called Panzerwerks. Reinforced steel cupolas provided firing points, and the approaches were covered by concrete anti-tank obstacles known as Dragon's Teeth. The Panzerwerks held enough food, water and ammunition to hold out for weeks. The problem for the German high command was finding the men to garrison them. Only ragtag units could be spared, and many of these arrived late. One Soviet tank brigade drove straight through unmanned fortifications. But a few hours later, the German army arrived and began digging sections of rail into the road, making it impassable for tanks. The next brigade to come down the road ran into fierce resistance. The brigade in front had been cut off. All attempts to break through were unsuccessful. The armoured cupolas were impervious to tank rounds, and in the rapid advance, the infantry and heavy artillery had been left far behind. That night, the men listened to the sounds of heavy fighting behind the German line, where their comrades were cut off. If German reserves arrived, the brigade would be wiped out. But not all sections of the Ostwall were held with such determination. The men holding the line near Schwibus didn't even have uniforms. They were men of the Volkssturm. Towards the end of 1944, with the German army increasingly short of manpower, Hitler authorised the raising of a national militia. It was called the Volkssturm, and Hitler confidently believed it would raise six million men and initiate a people's war against the invader. These hopes were wildly optimistic. At Poznanie, the Nazis hoped to raise 24 Volkssturm battalions, but could raise only one. All German males between 16 and 60 were eligible for conscription into the Volkssturm. The punishment for desertion was death. To ensure Volkssturm battalions possessed the necessary fanaticism to defeat the enemy, they were placed under the command of the Gauleiters, the local Nazi party bosses, rather than under army control. The Volkssturm received few weapons and little ammunition, although they had plenty of Panzerfaust anti-tank weapons. They received no uniforms, just an armband, which they wore over their civilian clothing. Predictably, such units proved ineffective in combat. At Schwibus, they could do little to hold up the Soviet First Guards Tank Brigade. The trapped Soviet brigade was rescued, and the advance continued to the Oder River. Similar events unfolded to the north at Meseritz. The 60-year-old Oberleutnant Hermann Stepp, commander of the 128th Volkssturm Battalion, described what happened to his Soviet captors. Als ich in Doppelfernglas die Panzer sah, sagte ich, dass wenn wir nicht schießen würden, würden die Russen auch dies nicht tun. Und so ist es geschehen. Wir haben die Weißeflagge aufgestellt und sind dann drauf.
The Volkssturm surrendered the defences around Meseritz without firing a shot. The Red Army broke through to the Oder and established bridgeheads just 70 kilometres from Berlin. Only there was the advance halted by the arrival of German reserves. By February 1945, the Soviet First Belarusian Front had fought its way across Germany to within 70 kilometers of the capital, Berlin. In just three weeks, across a 500 kilometer front, the Red Army had advanced 500 kilometers. Thousands of German civilians fled their homes, fearing the vengeance of the Red Army. Their fears proved well justified. Soviet soldiers had long been taught to despise their enemy. Germany was the lair of the fascist beast, and many set out to avenge bitter grievances. Amongst them was Yevgeny Basunov. We entered towns and saw two-story houses with nice tiled roofs. At first, we would set fire to these houses. We couldn't forget the sight of our own villages burned to the ground, with only chimneys standing amongst the ashes. It was not just property that felt the wrath of the Red Army. Soviet soldiers, many fueled by alcohol, were responsible for the rape of thousands of German women, many of whom they then murdered. Prisoners and civilians were frequently shot out of hand. Some Soviet soldiers were, for a time, out of control. Lazar Tsents was with the Red Army. In 1945, nobody would lay their hands on prisoners. But in 1944, vigilantism was common. Once, a master sergeant that I didn't know took five Germans outside and started shooting them one by one. I approached him, took his gun and said, you better kill them in battle. The looting of German property was systematic. The soldiers gathered luxuries they'd never known before. Jars of stewed fruit, jam and stewed meat. They took anything that was in short supply back home, including clothes, fabric, and shoes. Hey, народ, смотри, что на дыбал. Стюблеты хоть сейчас на свадьбу. А покажи свои. А у меня новые вообще. Ну еще у меня старые. Нет. Давай, Катна. Ой, какие. Хорош, хорош. Эй, земляк. Давай с нами. Давай меняться. У тебя не твой размер. Я же вижу. Эй, постой. There was even an official postal service for sending loot back home to families. Privates could send five kilograms per month, officers, ten. As the advance continued, commanders recognized that the brutal treatment of German civilians was inspiring the enemy to fight harder. They tried to clamp down on such behavior. Понял? Ну, 
Вот молодец. Товарищи, мы вступаем на территорию гитлеровской Германии. И мы знаем, что немцы принесли неисчислимые беды на нашу землю. Поэтому мы вступаем на их территорию, чтобы наказать немцев. Но всякое беспричинное нанесение ущерба немцам и немкам недопустимо. И будет строжайшим образом наказываться. Nevertheless, many officers continued to turn a blind eye to their men's behavior. As the Red Army entered East Prussia, Stalin himself was persuaded to issue an order forbidding the mistreatment of German civilians. Similar orders were issued by the military councils of the various fronts and armies. One order, signed by Marshal Rokossovsky, commanding the Second Bielorussian Front, urged all ranks to eradicate all activities shameful to the Red Army with the force of a red-hot iron. Задействие, несовместимые со званием бойца Красной Армии, виновные приговорены к расстрелу. In February 1945, as Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin gathered at Yalta to decide the future of post-war Europe, recent Red Army successes put Stalin in a strong position. The Western Allies made major concessions to Stalin over the Soviet-Polish border. They allowed the Soviet Union to keep much of the territory it had seized from Poland in 1939, including the city of Lvov, although Białystok would be returned. In compensation, Poland would receive German territory east of the Oder and most of East Prussia. A final decision was reached on the demilitarization and denazification of Germany. It is our inflexible purpose to destroy German militarism and Nazism and to ensure that Germany will never again be able to disturb the peace of the world. Germany was to be divided into four zones of occupation. In addition to the USSR, USA and Great Britain, one would also go to France. The German capital, situated in the Soviet zone, would itself be divided into four zones. Churchill pushed Stalin to commit to free and fair elections in Poland so that the country might choose its own government. Stalin agreed, but it was a promise he would never honor. Stalin made a further promise, that the USSR would join the war against Japan within 90 days of Germany's surrender. Meanwhile, at Poznanie, Chuikov's 8th Guards Army cleared German defenders from the rubble. The 2nd Assault Engineer Brigade prepared to storm the city's fortifications. Their main obstacle was a fire-swept moat, 10 meters wide and 8 meters deep. Under the cover of a smokescreen, the engineers rolled barrels filled with explosives into position. The fuse was to be lit at the last moment, and the barrel rolled forward into the moat. The explosion would kill German soldiers at their loopholes. Soviet assault groups waited to cross the moat and capture the wall. Within lay the citadel, 
Fort Vinyari. These formidable fortifications were held by several thousand diehards under the command of the fanatical Major General Ernst Gornell. The assault began on the 18th of February. Heavy artillery opened fire on the forts at point-blank range. The guns blew breaches in the walls wide enough for men to get through. Now, the barrels of explosives were lit and rolled into the moat. Survivors were left deafened and concussed. The assault groups crossed the moat using ladders and duckboards and fought their way into the city. The engineers built a bridge over the moat to get tanks and self-propelled guns into the city. The armoured vehicles brought resistance to an end. The month-long siege was over. General Gonel lay down on a swastika flag and shot himself. His deputy, General Matan, led more than 4,000 survivors into captivity. But elsewhere, the Nazis planned a last desperate counterattack to save Berlin. Heinrich Himmler, the commander of Army Group Vistula, hoped to turn the tables on the Red Army as it approached Berlin. His staff planned a counterattack by the 11th SS Panzer Army. Operation Solstice would be launched from Pomerania against the northern flank of Zhukov's 1st Belorussian Front. The Waffen SS grew out of the paramilitary wing of the Nazi Party. In 1939, it had just three regiments, which proved unreliable in combat. But as the war went on, the Waffen-SS expanded to more than 30 divisions and forged a reputation as an elite fighting force. Its units were the first to receive new equipment. By 1945, the Waffen-SS was a multinational force, its divisions manned by volunteers from across Europe. Many were now gathered in Pomerania, including the SS Nordland, Nederland, Wallonian, Langmark, Frunsberg, and Polizei. The German counterattack began on the 16th of February, 1945. But it could make little headway against Bilov's 61st Army and Bogdanov's 2nd Guards Tank Army. Then came Zhukov's response. He redirected two Soviet tank armies against the German forces in Pomerania. Within five days, T-34s from the tank armies of Katukov and Bogdanov had reached the Baltic Sea, trapping German forces who desperately sought to escape by sea. After this catastrophe, Hitler allowed Heinrich Himmler to resign his command of Army Group Vistula. Most Soviet guns were modern designs from the 1930s, but some were much older. The 305 mm howitzers still bore the double-headed eagle of the Romanovs. Their target was the fortress city of Königsberg, capital of East Prussia. In early April, there was a lull across much of the front. But here, the battle raged. The walls had to be smashed, and the Air Force could not help. It had been grounded again by bad weather. The heavy siege guns fired one round every three minutes. There would be four days of this before the assault began. 
Königsberg was defended by a series of modernized 19th century forts, their thick walls protected by tons of earth. But the Red Army bombardment was overwhelming. By 1945, the German situation in East Prussia was desperate. In late January, Soviet troops had reached the Vistula Lagoon, cutting off all German forces in East Prussia. Communication with the rest of Germany was only possible by sea. But the Germans stubbornly fought on. When the commander of the Third Belorussian Front was killed in action, Stalin sent Marshal Vasilevsky to replace him. Stalin urged him to secure a swift liquidation of the enemy to allow the Red Army to reinforce its assault on Berlin. But after assessing the situation, Vasilevsky decided against an immediate assault. He ordered three more weeks of preparation. First, he ordered an attack on German forces pinned against the coast southwest of Königsberg. The pocket was eliminated in late March. Now, it was time to attack the city itself. The Red Army had assembled a quarter of a million men for the final assault on Königsberg. They were supported by more than 5,000 guns and 500 armored vehicles. They conducted a thorough aerial reconnaissance of the city and its approaches. Soviet intelligence estimated the Königsberg garrison to be about 60,000 strong. It turned out to be a serious underestimate. The final assault began on the 6th of April 1945. The partially destroyed outlying forts offered no serious resistance. But on the approaches to the city, the Soviet advance bogged down. There were more Germans than they had reckoned with, and the Air Force was still grounded by bad weather. But on the 7th of April, the skies cleared. 500 Soviet bombers appeared overhead. The Luftwaffe was nowhere to be seen. Thousands of bombs rained down on the city. After the bombing, chaos reigned in Königsberg. Communications across the city had been cut. On the 8th of April, the remnants of the garrison were driven back into the center and east of the city. Communications with the port of Pilau were cut. Further resistance was pointless. The next day, the garrison surrendered. The true number of casualties was lost amidst the chaos and the propaganda. The Red Army claimed more than 40,000 enemy dead. It took up to 70,000 prisoners. Soviet casualties were up to 60,000, many more than were reported at the time. Königsberg had been virtually destroyed. The East Prussian campaign had reached its conclusion. The victorious Soviet forces rolled west once more to prepare for the final battle. The second Belarusian front would now take up positions along the River Oder, and then 
all would be in place for the final assault on Berlin. Red Army tank crews looked on intently as mechanics arrived carrying steel meshes. They began to fix them to their tank's hull and turret. It seemed a flimsy kind of armor, but this experiment could save the tank crews' lives. As Soviet tanks advanced into German towns and cities in the spring of 1945, they were regularly ambushed by German Panzerfaust teams. The Wehrmacht was running out of trained soldiers. They had been forced to conscript teenagers and old men. But even in their hands, the Panzerfaust could be just as lethal as a tank. commander of a Soviet guard's tank regiment described the aftermath. Here's a tank standing with the hatches buttoned down. There's a small hole burnt through the turret, just wide enough to put your little finger in. This is a Panzerfaust's work. We have to weld off the hatch, which is locked from inside. We pull four dead men from the turret. A hollow charge round has burnt through the armor, and the spitting of melting metal has killed them all. Engineers believed steel meshes could protect Soviet tanks by causing the Panzerfaust warhead to explode before it reached the tank's armor. The report read, the surface of the mesh was torn and bent as a result of the impact. There was a hole in the tank's sloping armor plate. It went right through. So the Panzerfaust could kill a T-34 even if it was cloaked in the protective mesh. Nonetheless, many tank crews adopted this new measure. In this bitter fighting, they were willing to try anything that gave them an added chance of survival. On the 31st of January 1945, tanks of the 1st Bielorussian Front reached the Oder River near Kustrin and Frankfurt and der Oder. They crossed without waiting for the infantry to catch up. They had advanced 400 kilometers across Poland. 35 destroyed enemy divisions and hundreds of thousands of prisoners lay in their wake. They were now just 100 kilometers from Berlin, the lair of the Nazi beast. But now, the Stavka Soviet High Command ordered a halt. The frontline troops needed resupply and rest before they were ready to begin the final assault. 
In March 1945, Pomerania to the north and Silesia to the south were cleared of German troops. The flanks were secure for the drive on Berlin. The Germans attempted a counterattack at Kustrin, but it ended in complete failure. In the process, some of the last armoured forces available for the defence of Berlin were destroyed. From his Führer bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery, Hitler raged at this latest failure. He was particularly scathing of the commander of the 9th Army, Theodor Busa. But when Chief of the General Staff Heinz Guderian stood up for Busa, Hitler's wrath fell on him instead. Guderian was sent on leave, effectively enforced retirement. His successor was General Hans Krebs. Hans Krebs had been a military attaché in Moscow when the war began. More recently, he'd been chief of staff for Modal's Army Group B, which that winter had launched the Ardennes Offensive against the Western Allies. During his career, Krebs had shown a talent for planning defensive operations. Now, Hitler expected a miracle from him in Berlin. As Guderian packed his bags, an old acquaintance of his was preparing for the final push on Berlin. He was the Soviet general Semyon Krivoshein. The two men had met in September 1939 in Poland during the Nazi-Soviet carve-up of the country. Semyon Moseyevich Krivoshein began his military career in 1918 with the cavalry. In 1939, as part of the Nazi-Soviet partition of Poland, his brigade occupied Brest in modern Belarus. This was when Krivoshein met Guderian, the German general responsible for handing over control of the city to the Soviets. In 1945, Krivoshein commanded the 1st Mechanized Corps. It was the only unit of the 1st Russian Front to be completely equipped with American Sherman tanks. First Mechanized Corps was on the eastern bank of the Oder River, but every night its soldiers crossed the river to help dig emplacements for guns and tanks. On the night of the 15th of April, the Corps crossed the Oder to take up these prepared positions. As Hitler ranted and raved at his generals, commander of the 1st Russian Front, Marshal Zhukov, was summoned to Moscow. He and Stalin were to discuss details of the final assault on Berlin. Zhukov had prepared two plans for the offensive on the German capital. Plan A envisaged a thrust from the Kustrin bridgehead. Plan B from the bridgehead near Frankfurt. The Germans would be kept guessing as to which was the real line of advance, forcing them to disperse their troops. But bad news awaited Zhukov in the Kremlin. In his memoirs, he described a late-night meeting with Stalin. He was told, the German front in the west has completely collapsed. The Germans don't seem to be willing to take any measures to stop the advance of the Western Allies. British and American troops had crossed the Rhine. They had destroyed German Army Group B on the Ruhr. Their armoured divisions were advancing rapidly towards Berlin. Although the Allies had agreed at Yalta that Berlin would be in the Soviet zone of occupation, the Western Allies hadn't ruled out entering the city before the Red Army. Winston Churchill had expressed his opinion to the American president. Russian armies will no doubt enter Vienna. If they also take Berlin, will not their impression that they have been the overwhelming contributor to our common victory be unduly imprinted in their minds? I therefore consider that should Berlin be in our grasp, we should certainly take it. Zhukov understood. He put forward the plan that could be implemented most rapidly a single assault from the Kustrin bridgehead. Marshal Konyev, 
commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front, also flew to the Stavka headquarters in Moscow. In his memoirs, Konyev recalled, the chief of staff read aloud a telegram, the point of which was that the Western Allies were preparing an operation to capture Berlin. Stalin addressed Zhukov and myself. So, who is going to take Berlin? Are we or are the Allies? I was the first to answer. We shall take Berlin and we'll take it before the Allies. The general staff worked night and day as they planned the operation. One of the directives received by the first Belarusian front ran as follows. After the German defences have been breached, tank armies are to be introduced on the line of the main thrust to enable the envelopment of Berlin from the north and northeast. The purpose of this manoeuvre was to block the Western Allies' eastward advance on Berlin. The prize was not for sharing. Zhukov planned to deliver the main thrust through the Silov Heights, held by General Weidling's 56th Panzer Corps. Then the Soviet armies would race west and establish a perimeter in the suburbs of Berlin. This cordon would prevent German forces retreating into the city. Konyev was unhappy that he was not making the main assault on Berlin. Instead, his front would encircle the city from the southwest. But Konyev ordered his staff to prepare two plans, one following the Stavka's directives, the other planning a quick dash to Berlin. Meanwhile, in Berlin, life went on. Most services continued to run, including public transport. In response to the air raids, many had volunteered to help with firefighting or to help clear debris. There were still films and concerts, but over everything hung a sense of fear, a fear of what was to come. Berlin bore the unmistakable scars of war, cratered streets and scorched, ruined buildings. Now Berliners helped to build barricades as the city prepared to defend itself. Berlin's barricades were made of wood, stone and rails. They could be up to 2.5 metres high and 4 metres thick. They made many streets completely impassable and the approaches to them were mined. Immobilised tanks were dug in at crossroads and became fixed gun emplacements. Berlin also boasted three massive flak towers built to defend the city from Allied air raids. These were 40 metres high and bristled with anti-aircraft artillery. Many Berliners now wore the armband of the Volkssturm, the German equivalent of the Home Guard. These units were controlled not by the army, but by the Nazi party. The Volkssturm was formed in October 1944, after Hitler ordered the mobilisation of all German males between the age of 16 and 60. By 1945, this meant the conscription of the only men left, teenagers, invalids and the elderly. The Nazis hoped to create a fanatical people's militia, but most had little stomach for a one-sided fight with the Red Army. There were very few weapons available for these units. Some received Italian or Dutch rifles with just a few cartridges. But there were plenty of Panzerfausts. The Panzerfaust was a one-shot disposable launcher that fired a hollow charge anti-tank warhead. It was very cheap and easy to make. The Germans produced more than six million of them between 1943 and the end of the war. The most common version, the Panzerfaust 60, had an effective tank killing range of 60 metres. Its warhead travelled at 45 metres per second and was able to penetrate 200 millimetres of armour. This was very bad news for Soviet tank crews. The front armour of a T-34 medium tank was just 45 millimetres. 
and of an East II heavy tank, 120 millimetres. Standing between Zhukov and the capital of the Third Reich were four German armies. They consisted of nearly a million soldiers, more than a thousand armoured vehicles and almost 10,000 guns and mortars. More than 200 Volkssturm battalions were formed into the Berlin Army Command Reserve. The Berlin garrison itself totaled more than 200,000 men. Busse was extremely cynical about their prospects. We will consider our task fulfilled, he wrote, if American tanks strike us in our back. The German general staff believed the fate of Berlin would be decided on the Seeloff Heights. Therefore, most troops were committed to the front rather than held back inside the city. On the 15th of April, a proclamation from the Führer was read out to the troops. Berlin will remain German, Vienna will remain German, and Europe will never be Russian. Form a single community to defend not the empty word fatherland, but your families, your wives, your children, and hence your own future. The slogan, Berlin will remain German, appeared, daubed on walls around the city. Many still believed that somehow the city could be saved. Troops of the first Belarusian front were addressed by their commissar. Our troops have traveled a difficult but glorious road. Our battle standards are covered with glorious victories, won at Stalingrad and Kursk, on the Dnieper and in Belarusia, at Warsaw and in Pomerania, in Brandenburg and at the Oder. With our own sweat and blood, we have earned the right to assault Berlin, to be first to enter the city. To Berlin! At 3 a.m. on the 16th of April, 1945, more than 7,000 guns, mortars and Katyusha rocket launchers began an earth-shaking bombardment of the German line. It was one of the greatest concentrations of firepower ever seen. In Berlin, the bombardment was heard like the sound of distant thunder. In houses closer to the front, pictures fell off walls and windows shattered. In Munchenberg, the cross tumbled from the church spire. Amongst the guns were six massive 280mm mortars from the 34th Independent Battalion of Heavy Artillery. When the bombardment stopped, 150 giant searchlights were switched on, pointed straight at the German lines. The searchlights were Zhukov's idea. They were supposed to light the way and dazzle the German defenders. But they struggled to penetrate the thick morning mist and the smoke and dust thrown up by the barrage. The searchlights proved just as effective at dazzling their own men. And many were silhouetted by the lights becoming easy targets for the Germans. The Germans had known the initial bombardment would be massive. So most of their troops had already been withdrawn to the second line. This allowed Soviet troops to advance the first few kilometers with relative ease. As the sun rose, the searchlights were turned off. Despite the early success, it was clear by afternoon that there had been no immediate breakthrough. The Seeloff Heights were defended by a network of machine gun nests and gun emplacements. It was a slow and bloody process for the Soviet infantry to fight their way through. 
the advance of the first Belarusian front was supported by 800 Soviet aircraft. Unchallenged by the Luftwaffe, they arrived overhead to batter the German positions. By 1 p.m., Zhukov explained, I clearly understood that the enemy's defensive fire system was intact. So to reinforce the attacking troops and ensure a breakthrough, we decided to feed both tank armies into the battle. His decision created huge traffic jams on the approaches to the Seeloff Heights. Tanks, artillery tractors and supply trucks all struggled to get forward. By committing his tank armies to the battle, Zhukov had altered the plan that he'd agreed with the Stavka. It showed desperation. And Stalin was not happy. He rang Zhukov to reprimand him for this unauthorized use of the tank reserve. And he demanded to know when the breakthrough would be made. Zhukov tried to remain calm. The enemy's defenses at the Seeloff Heights will be breached tomorrow, he told Stalin. Now, Zhukov had to make it happen. Zhukov's advance, led by Chuikov's 8th Guards Army and Katakov's 1st Guards Tank Army, was faltering on the Seeloff Heights. Meanwhile, Marshal Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front was advancing towards the Nysa River and the forests southeast of Berlin. The Germans had no forces here able to withstand his assault. On the evening of the 17th of April, Konyev informed Stalin that he was ready to send two tank armies to help Zhukov. Stalin thought about it for a moment. Then he agreed. Very good, he said. Direct the tank armies towards Berlin. Konyev immediately issued orders to Rybalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army and Lila Yushchenko's 4th Guards Tank Army to turn towards Berlin. At the Nysa River, Rybalko's troops found a ford, no more than a metre deep. Rather than wait for bridging equipment, his tank crews made their vehicles watertight and drove straight across. By the third day of the offensive, tanks of the first Ukrainian front were poised to break through the German defences. At the same moment, Zhukov's troops were at last about to break through German positions on the Seeloff Heights. General Krivoshein's motorized infantry had managed to capture an intact bridge at the town of Platkov. Now his first mechanized corps was advancing unchecked. Behind them rolled the T-34s of Bogdanov's 2nd Guards tank army. On the 20th of April, wrote General Weidling, commanding the German defence, our units, having suffered huge losses and exhausted to extremity, could no longer withstand the pressure of the Russian assault. Weidling's corps was outflanked on both sides. That evening, Zhukov entrusted General Semen Bogdanov with a historic mission to lead his second guards tank army into Berlin and to become the first Soviet troops to enter the enemy capital. The next day, Krivoshein's first mechanized corps, part of the second guards tank army, reached the Berlin suburb of Weissensee and fulfilled the mission. 
For this, Kriver Shane received his nation's highest award, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. The main force of the first Belarusian front was now sweeping around Weidling's shattered core and arriving en masse at the outskirts of Berlin. Konyev's dream of conquering Berlin had been thwarted. Forests and lakes, minefields and pillboxes had slowed his advance. There was hard fighting around Zossen, from where the Wehrmacht High Command had recently fled. But his advance had trapped 20,000 men of the German 9th and 4th Panzer Army in the forests south of Berlin. These men could no longer reach the city to help in its defence. Hitler faced a dilemma. Stay in the capital or flee to his Alpine fortress. He pinned his hopes on the army detachment of SS General Felix Steiner. Hitler telegraphed the general. The primary task before army detachment Steiner is to attack from the north. The fate of the capital of the Third Reich depends on how successfully you execute this mission. It was an impossible order that could not be carried out. When Hitler was told this, he flew into a rage, accusing the army of cowardice and treason. It's all over, he at last recognized. The Führer would stay in Berlin, but he clutched at one last straw, General Wenck's 12th Army facing the Americans on the Elbe River. On the 23rd of April, Wenck was ordered to relieve Berlin. But neither Steiner nor Wenck could save the capital. The Berlin garrison was formed from a host of shattered army and SS divisions, supplemented by Volkssturm battalions, police and air defence units, about 120,000 men in total. It was not enough, although many of the SS men were prepared to fight until the end. The Soviets outnumbered the Germans by more than four to one. And many Red Army soldiers were now battle-hardened veterans, graduates of the Stalingrad Academy of Street Fighting. Soviet tanks advanced on both sides of the street in a staggered double file. They kept 30 meters behind the infantry and used their main gun to take out defensive strongpoints that were holding up the advance. Infantry squads and snipers worked to flush out the German Panzerfausters. The Soviets knew that the Panzerfaust had a short range, about 60 metres. So tanks would pull up 150 metres from an enemy-held building and shell it from a safe range. When assault teams captured a building, they used smoke grenades to fill the street with smoke, allowing more troops to move up in safety. General Krivoshane's mechanized corps was redeployed to the northwestern suburbs. After crossing the river Spree, it joined up with Rybalko's 3rd Guards tank army to complete the encirclement of Berlin. The river Spree curled through the German defences. In places, the river was 200 metres wide. The Germans considered this an impenetrable barrier, and so the south bank was lightly defended. 
the appearance of Soviet motorboats was therefore an unpleasant surprise for the Germans. These boats of the Dnieper fleet had been transported by road and were now launched onto the spree. The amphibious assault succeeded in establishing a foothold across the river. Reinforcements were then quickly ferried in to shore up the position. This sudden advance, where it was least expected, threw the German defensive plan into chaos. Several blocks were given up without a fight as units raced back to avoid being cut off. The Red Army troops were all aiming for one spot, the Reichstag building. The Reichstag building was completed in 1894. In the interwar period of the Weimar Republic, it was where the lower chamber of the German parliament met. In 1933, shortly after Hitler came to power, it caught fire in suspicious circumstances. Hitler accused the communists of starting the fire as part of a plot against the government. The next day, the Reichstag fire decree gave the Nazi party emergency powers to deal with its political opponents. In effect, it was the death of democracy in Germany. The Reichstag building no longer had a purpose. The center of government was now located somewhere else entirely, inside the Führerbunker, 25 feet beneath the garden of the old Reich Chancellery. The bunker had been built during the war in complete secrecy. By April 1945, it had become Adolf Hitler's permanent residence and the site of his military headquarters. According to those who experienced life inside the bunker, the place smelled of wet cement and there was a constant drone from the ventilation system. It was claustrophobic, but impervious to bombs and shells. The Red Army didn't know about the Führerbunker, even as their tanks fired onto the Reich Chancellery itself. The observation point of the 34th Battalion of Heavy Artillery was located in an elevator tower on Schlesingerstrasse. They couldn't see the Reichstag, only flames and smoke. On the 27th of April, their unit was ordered forward. As the artillery spotters looked for a new vantage point, their telephone rang. A voice demanded to speak to the senior officer. Sergeant Pavel Larin, commander of the scout section, was given the phone. 18th orders you to fire on target 21, said the voice. Target 21 was the Reichstag building. Sergeant Larin acknowledged the order. His battery hadn't fired on the Reichstag before, and Larin knew that there were Red Army troops just 300 metres from it. Firing from a range of three miles, the smallest mistake in their calculations could end up killing their own comrades. Larin also knew that any delay in the fire mission would not be forgiven. The BR-5 heavy mortar fired an anti-concrete round that weighed 246 kilograms and carried 58 kilograms of explosive. This shell made a crater 10 metres wide and 6 metres deep. The battery fired 42 shells, one after another. Then the phone rang again. At the other end of the line, they were shouting to cease fire they'd been hitting their own positions. 
the new order was to fire on Target 20. Target 20 was the Reich Chancellery. The battery fired 18 rounds. The forward unit came back on the phone. Good shooting. I officially thank you on behalf of the assaulting units. Pavel Larin had just played his small part in the fall of Berlin. The Soviet Third Shock Army was leading the race to the Reichstag. Its commander was Vasily Kuznetsov, the same Kuznetsov who'd faced the Germans on the first day of the war, near the Belarusian town of Grodno, as he struggled to save his Third Army from encirclement. His war looked like it would finish in the Baltic, where he'd been a deputy front commander. Then, in March 1945, Zhukov clashed with Nikolai Simonyak, commanding the Third Shock Army. It was just two weeks before the Berlin operation. The experienced Kuznetsov was flown in as a replacement. The Third Shock Army had fought its way through the northern suburbs of Berlin. Now, Kuznetsov's men were just 800 meters from the Reichstag building. The first attempt on the Reichstag took place on the 29th of April. But the attacking troops were fired on from the rear by Germans in the Kroll Opera House. So first, the Opera House had to be cleared. Soviet infantry attacked again at 11.30 a.m. on the 30th of April. They were supported by artillery fire falling directly onto the Reichstag building. At 10.30 p.m., the victory banner finally flew above the Reichstag building. previous morning, Hitler had spoken with Major General Monka, commanding the defence of the Berlin Central Sector. He asked him, how long will you be able to hold out? 20 to 24 hours maximum, came the reply. That evening, Hitler ordered a report on the status of Wenck's 12th Army. The answer came at 1am. Wenck had been forced to abandon his attempt to relieve Berlin. 14 hours later, Hitler shot himself. His body was carried to a shell hole outside the entrance to the Führer bunker, covered in petrol and burned. Under a white flag, a delegation led by Chief of the General Staff Hans Krebs approached the Soviet lines. They were taken to see General Chuikov at 8th Guards Army headquarters. Krebs informed Chuikov of Hitler's death and the formation of a new German government under Grand Admiral Dönitz. But Chuikov refused to negotiate. His demands were simple and to the point. He wanted the immediate and unconditional surrender of the Berlin garrison. The Germans refused. The fighting went on. After returning from his failed negotiations, General Krebs committed suicide in the Führer bunker on the 1st of May. It fell to General Weidling to surrender the Berlin garrison and end the fighting. Weidling contacted the Soviets by radio. Please cease fire. 
we will send truce envoys to the Potsdam Bridge at 12.50 p.m. Berlin time. The arrangements of the surrender were agreed at these brief negotiations. At about 6 a.m. the next day, the 2nd of May, the headquarters of the Berlin garrison crossed the front line and surrendered. From captivity, Weidling issued his last order. On the 30th of April, the Führer committed suicide, thus abandoning those who had sworn loyalty to him. The situation makes further resistance meaningless. I order the immediate cessation of resistance. This order was relayed through loudspeakers. The Germans began to put down their weapons. The Battle of Berlin was one of the largest battles in history. About three and a half million men fought on both sides. During the campaign, Red Army soldiers liberated hundreds of thousands of prisoners from German concentration camps. Amongst them were more than 200,000 foreign nationals. They included Edouard Herriot, the former Prime Minister of France, and General Otto Ruger, commander of the Norwegian army. On the 7th of May, the German instrument of surrender was signed at Reims in France. The signatories were the German General Alfred Jodl, US General Walter Smith, Soviet General Ivan Suslaparov, and French General Francois Seves as the official witness. But the Soviet Union decided Suslaparov did not have proper authority to sign the surrender. It would have to be done again. And so, on the 8th of May, 10.43 p.m. Central European time, Field Marshal Keitel, representing the German army, General Stumpf of the Luftwaffe and Admiral von Friedeberg of the Kriegsmarine signed another act of surrender in Berlin in the presence of Marshal Georgi Zhukov and Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder. On the 9th of May, the Red Army entered Prague. On the 10th of May, the Red Army occupied the Hell Peninsula in the Danzig Bay. And on the 11th of May, German Army Group Courland finally surrendered. In these last days of the war, 1.2 million German soldiers were taken prisoner, including 101 generals. On the 24th of June, a victory parade was held in Moscow's Red Square. Marshal Rokossovsky commanded the parade. Marshal Zhukov inspected the troops. Thus ended the Great Patriotic War of the Soviet people. Sergeant Pavel Larin never found out who 18th was, the voice who'd ordered him to fire on the Reichstag and Reich Chancellery. He was just thankful to have survived the war. On the morning of the 3rd of May, Larin was ordered to go to the Reich Chancellery and document the effects of their bombardment. The Berlin garrison had surrendered, but suddenly they came under fire from a machine gunner on a rooftop. Luckily, he missed. Larin wasn't allowed to enter the Reich Chancellery. It was being visited by Zhukov and the front commanders. The artilleryman made his notes and headed towards the Reichstag. It was difficult to get in there, too. The building was crowded with thousands of soldiers celebrating their victory. Then, standing on his comrades' shoulders, he wrote on the wall, Sergeant Pavel Larin.
The Soviet assault team advanced through the ruins of Königsberg with the confidence of veterans. They used the cover of the smoke and buildings and cleared the way with short bursts of submachine gun fire. It was April 1945, and the Red Army was clearing the last German stronghold in East Prussia. At the headquarters of the Third Bielorussian Front, Marshal Vasilevsky followed events with satisfaction. He was generous with his praise. But many of his commanders knew he was mentally selecting the men to take with him on his next assignment. He had already been told what to expect. In the summer of 1944, I learned that after the Bielorussian operation, I would have to go to the Far East. Stalin told me that I would be given command of the army there for the war against Japan. Stalin had promised the Allies that he would join the war against Japan within 90 days of Germany's surrender. In turn, he had been assured that certain Soviet territorial demands in the Far East would be met. As the fighting continued in the East Prussian capital of Königsberg, the Soviet Union denounced its 1941 neutrality pact with Japan. It had done little to ease tension between the two powers. Stalin had kept almost 40 divisions stationed in the Far East throughout the war. The Soviet denunciation of the neutrality pact was a clear warning of Stalin's intentions. Now, the Red Army began to build up its forces in the Far East. The new arrivals included the 53rd Army and 6th Guards Tank Army, redeployed from Czechoslovakia. Their experience of fighting in the mountains of Romania and Austria would prove extremely valuable in the Far East. Some of the soldiers thought they were going home after the defeat of Nazi Germany. But their war wasn't over yet. Japan had attacked Manchuria in northeast China in 1931, before Hitler even came to power. It led to border clashes with the Soviets at Lake Hassan in 1938 and Haohingol in 1939. Japan had embarked on a policy of ruthless imperial expansion, which brought war with China, America, and the British Empire. After Germany's defeat, the Allies met for a conference at Potsdam, near Berlin. There, the US, the UK, and China issued a stark threat to Japan. Surrender, or face prompt, and utter destruction. The Japanese response was predictable. Prime Minister Kantaro Suzuki stated that the Japanese government would ignore the declaration and move forward to successfully conclude the war. 
The response condemned the country to a terrible, unprecedented fate. In the New Mexico desert, the Americans had just tested the first atomic bomb. On the 26th of July, 1945, the USS Indianapolis delivered the Little Boy bomb to the US base on Tinian Island. Two days later, General Marshall, the US Chief of Staff, confirmed the order authorizing its use against Japan. The primary target was the city of Hiroshima. Alternative targets were Kokura and Nagasaki. Many civilians had been evacuated from Hiroshima because of the threat of air raids. But at the time of the attack, there were still 350,000 people living in the city. On the 6th of August, at 8.15 a.m., the bomb was dropped from a height of nine kilometers. 43 seconds later, 600 meters above the city, the bomb exploded with the force of 13,000 tons of TNT. 70,000 people were killed almost instantly. It's estimated that the effects of radiation killed the same number again within six months. Within five years, total fatalities had reached 200,000. Three days later, the Americans dropped a plutonium bomb with an explosive force equivalent to 21 kilotons of TNT on Nagasaki. According to a report of the Nagasaki prefecture, everyone within a one kilometer radius was killed instantly. Within two kilometers, almost all houses were destroyed. And within three kilometers, all flammable material was set on fire. By the end of 1945, total deaths in Nagasaki had reached 80,000. In the years that followed, thousands more died from leukemia and cancers caused by the effects of radiation. blows against Japan did not immediately break the country's will to fight on. Few outside the affected areas knew anything about the bombings. Members of Japan's Supreme Council still believed they could negotiate an end to the war. But a third catastrophic blow was materializing. The Japanese had detected heavy troop movements along the Trans-Siberian Railway. It could mean only one thing. US forces had just completed a brutal struggle for the island of Okinawa, 300 miles south of the Japanese mainland. The experience taught them that an invasion of the Japanese homeland would be a long and bloody affair. The war might drag on for at least another year. But a blow from the seasoned Red Army could prove decisive, particularly if it was struck against a strategically vital part of the Japanese Empire. Manchuria, in northeast China, was such a place. With Korea to the south, it was indispensable to Japan's economy. Its industries produced coal, iron, steel, electricity, and more than half of Japan's synthetic fuel. Factories had been moved here from Japan to be out of range of US bombers. The loss of Manchuria 
would make it impossible for Japan to fight on. Через большой хинган и всю Манчжурию на танках перейти, это тебе не шоссе Франкфурт-Берлин. А еще через пару недель дожди пойдут. С горючкой проблемы будут. Я вот что предлагаю. Значит, берем... The sheer size of the theater of operations was daunting enough. Manchuria is as big as Germany and Italy combined. Its central plain is like a fortress, surrounded by a ring of mountains. And the remoteness of its frontiers was another important factor. Between the Far East and the Russian interior, the roads and railways simply did not exist to move or supply a big army. Japanese forces in Manchuria, centered on the Kwantung army, had been greatly weakened to reinforce the Pacific, but still contained 700,000 men. The commander of the Kwantung army, General Yamada, knew it was impossible to defend the whole length of the frontier. So he placed only light screening forces along the border. His reserves were located in the interior. They were stationed close to railway hubs, ready for rapid deployment when the enemy's intentions became clear. The Soviet high command planned nothing less than a double envelopment of the whole of Manchuria. One pincer would attack from Mongolia, the other from Vladivostok. The attack from the west would be made by Marshal Malinovsky's Transbaikal Front. From the east, by Marshal Meretskov's first Far Eastern Front. The distance between the two forces was 3,000 kilometers. In the path of General Kravchenko's 6th Guards tank army lay the greater Chingang range. Kravchenko's orders stipulated that he was to cross the mountains in no more than five days. Any holdup, and the Japanese could send troops to fortify the passes. And then, the entire Soviet offensive could grind to a halt. At the Yalta Conference in February 1945, Stalin had promised that the Soviet Union would join the war against Japan no more than 90 days after Germany's surrender. He would keep his word, just. Exactly 90 days after Germany's surrender, troops of the Soviet First Far Eastern Front prepared to go into action. August in Manchuria is the rainy season. The downpour began on the 8th of August, the eve of the offensive. Some river levels rose by two or three meters. The ground was soon sodden. The Manchurian strategic offensive operation would begin in the dark, in the pouring rain. There was to be no artillery preparation. The Japanese were to have no warning. Ну и погодка, черт бы ее побрал. Сколько там еще? Тридцать минуты. The attack would be led by assault teams supported by ISU-152 self-propelled guns. But their main weapon would be surprise. The assault teams were built around hardened veterans of the fighting in Europe. For identification, they sewed patches of white cloth to their caps and tunics. The password was Petrov. At 1 a.m. on the 9th of August, assault troops of the 1st Far Eastern Front began their advance.
scouts led the way, laying telephone wire for the infantry to follow. At the command posts, officers waited anxiously for news. If the attack failed, it would be plan B, a four-hour artillery barrage. The Red Army's sudden onslaught against Manchuria took the Japanese by surprise. Some soldiers were caught still in their barracks. Those that manned their defensive positions in time were soon encircled and are taken out with explosives or flamethrowers. The assault teams used infiltration tactics to bypass enemy strong points and advance up to 20 kilometers in the first few hours of the operation. The city of Mudanjiang was next in their sights. The Soviet advance was so fast and unexpected that it took several hours for news of the attack to filter back to Guangdong Army headquarters and from there to Tokyo. The Japanese command had believed that the Soviets would not be ready to attack for several more weeks. General Yamada was so sure of this that on the 9th of August, he was at a conference hundreds of miles from his headquarters. The Trans-Baikal Front Offensive began at dawn and met little resistance. Kravchenko's 6th Guards Tank Army led the way, with 75,000 soldiers, 6,000 vehicles, 800 tanks, and 200 self-propelled guns. The T-34s and Lend-Lease Shermans advanced alongside old BT-5s and T-26s, which had been stationed in the Far East throughout the war. They overran the weak Japanese units in their path and advanced 120 kilometers on the first day. A simultaneous supporting attack was made along the rail line. As the first reports of the Soviet attack reached the Japanese high command, the senior staff did not initially comprehend its scale. Yamada received instructions to maintain a staunch defense of areas occupied by Japanese troops and prepare for large-scale military operations. But there was more news that day. From Hiroshima came a detailed report on the scale of the devastation. Then, a few hours after the Soviet attack, 
news arrived that a second bomb had been dropped on Nagasaki. These blows, coming one after another, were a profound shock to the Japanese leadership. Prime Minister Suzuki told a meeting of the Supreme Council that the Soviet Union's entry into the war made the situation hopeless. It was impossible to continue. The Allied terms offered at Potsdam must be accepted. That night, the meeting was resumed in the presence of Emperor Hirohito. It continued into the small hours of the morning. Following the Emperor's lead, the Council finally agreed to the Allied terms. But they demanded an assurance that the Emperor would retain his position. This was rejected. Only unconditional surrender was acceptable. The war continued. In eastern Manchuria, the infantry advanced with well-practiced assault drills. The men blasted their way in through the armored door. It became routine to completely demolish these bunkers. Otherwise, Japanese survivors would hide and wait for the first wave to pass, then rush back to their positions and resume firing. Mine clearance experts who had served in Germany were struck by the simplicity of Japanese minefields. They caused little hold-up for the Soviet tanks and infantry. The Red Army met more serious opposition to the north, around the Hyla fortified zone. After several days of heavy fighting, the Japanese defenders were encircled. Then, the Air Force went in. More than 80 Soviet bombers dropped 120 tons of bombs on the Japanese. Two hours later, they surrendered. Kravchenko's tank army, meanwhile, struggled through the passes of the greater Chingan Mountains. The 26-ton tanks crawled along the old caravan routes. Where the track was too narrow, they widened it with explosives or improvised other solutions. Captain Dmitry Loza led a tank battalion through the mountains. Two tank recovery vehicles were chained together at the top of a mountain. One had a winch, the other acted as the anchor. A tank was attached to the winch cable and put into first gear. Then it was slowly lowered down the slope. And this is how we got them down safely. By the 12th of August, the mountains were behind them. They were through with one day to spare. They left an old BT tank at a crossing and inscribed on its turret, Soviet tanks passed here 1945. But as the tanks began to cross the plain, dark specks appeared on the horizon. Japanese aircraft arrived to strafe the Soviet columns with cannon and bombs. Some even made suicidal ramming attacks. Nine kamikaze attacks were recorded by the tank crews but not a single tank was lost. 
Tank tracks quickly chewed the wet dirt roads into bogs. So resupply became a major problem. Two transport divisions of the 12th Air Army were given the job of flying fuel to the front. But despite making 160 deliveries per day, it wasn't enough. As the Soviet advance struggled on, on the 14th of August, news came that the Japanese government had agreed to surrender. A message had been sent to the governments of Great Britain, America, the Soviet Union, and China that it was Emperor Hirohito's will that Japan accept all the Allies' conditions set out at Potsdam. The war should have been over, but the order to surrender was slow to reach the Kwantung army. General Yamada's orders only instructed him to immediately burn all banners, imperial portraits and edicts, and all secret documents. In Western Manchuria, the increasingly one-sided fight caused many Japanese troops to surrender regardless. In Eastern Manchuria, the Soviet First Far Eastern Front faced a different situation. Suicide attacks by Japanese infantry. A special unit of 1,700 soldiers under an officer named Kobayashi was sent into battle near Mudanjang. General Beloborodov witnessed their attack. Soldiers in green uniforms emerged from camouflaged foxholes and ran at the tanks. The paratroopers shot them down. They were decimated by machine guns. But more of them emerged from foxholes and trenches, throwing themselves at the tanks. On the 15th of August, 1945, as Emperor Hirohito made a radio address to the Japanese people announcing his decision to surrender, Soviet tanks of the 5th Army rolled on towards Mudanjang. The next day, the Soviet general staff issued a bulletin. The Emperor's statement of the 14th of August regarding Japan's capitulation was only a general statement accepting unconditional surrender. No order was issued to the armed forces to cease fire, and Japanese forces continue to resist. Thus, in effect, there has been no capitulation. The Japanese aircraft was acting strangely. It flew slowly and waggled its wings as it approached the Soviet lines. The anti-aircraft gunners took a chance and held their fire. It was a message from General Yamada's staff informing the Red Army that he had ordered a ceasefire. It was not news to Marshal Vasilevsky. His headquarters had already received a radio communication from General Yamada, stating that he had ordered his men to lay down their arms. Some Japanese troops began to surrender, including the garrison of the Hyla fortified area holding the rail line. But other units did not receive or chose to ignore the order. So Vasilevsky sent Yamada an ultimatum. I propose that at noon on the 20th of August, you cease all military operations against Soviet forces, lay down your arms and surrender. Oh, 
The waterlogged plain meant that the railway line was the only way for Kravchenko's tanks to advance. But a two-day march along the rails was tough on men and vehicles. Any breakdown brought the whole column to a standstill. Some tanks were simply shoved off the embankment to make way. But the long advance was taking its toll. One corps was down from 200 tanks to just 70. Marshal Vasilevsky now demanded the immediate capture of Changchun, Mukden, Jilin, and Harbin by highly mobile task forces to be supported by airborne landings. On the 19th of August, seven Lisunov twos carrying 175 officers and men left for Jilin. They were escorted by four fighters and three PE-2 bombers. The Japanese command had been officially informed of the landing. As the second aircraft came in to land, the Japanese suddenly opened fire. The unit's commander was Colonel Dmitry Krutsky. I was standing by the aircraft's wheel when the Japanese opened fire. I received a light facial wound. I led my soldiers into the attack and we captured eight Hotchkiss machine guns and took 40 prisoners. To tell the truth, we tried not to take prisoners. We were too mad. We'd had a deal and they started shooting at us. Airborne units, 200 strong, were also sent to seize control of the Japanese airfields at Harbin, Mukden and Changchun. As Soviet fighters circled the landing zones, the transport planes made their drop. Within 24 hours, the paratroopers were relieved by Soviet tanks. On the 19th of August, Japanese troops began to surrender en masse. Most combat operations came to an end, but fighting continued on the island of Sakhalin, where Soviet infantry carried out amphibious landings on the 20th of August. Five days later, the Red Army entered the capital Toyohara and accepted the surrender of 18,000 Japanese troops. To prevent the destruction of important industrial and naval facilities, detachments of the 6th Guards Tank Army boarded trains at Mukden and raced south to the large Japanese naval bases at Port Arthur and Dolny. Paratroopers were sent ahead to make sure the Americans didn't get there first. The two powers were already positioning themselves for the Cold War that was to come. In one of the most remote outposts of the Soviet Empire, naval gunners were hard at work. The coastal battery at Cape Lopatka was firing at an island, barely visible on the horizon. The target was Shumshu, the northernmost of the Japanese-held Kuril Islands. It was the prelude to an invasion. In exchange for joining the war against Japan, Stalin was promised certain Japanese territories, including the Kuril Islands and South Sakhalin. He also had his eyes on Hokkaido. But the new American president, Harry Truman, was alarmed by these concessions. In his view, too much had been promised to the Soviets. He asked his commanders to look at ways to prevent the Soviet occupation of the islands. So Stalin decided to present the Allies with a fait accompli. A few hours after the Emperor of Japan announced his nation's surrender, Marshal Vasilevsky ordered the invasion of the Kuril Islands to proceed. 
The operation would be launched from Soviet bases in the Kamchatka Peninsula. Their initial objectives were the islands of Shumshu, Paramushir, and Onokotan. The invasion would be led by Major General Dyakov's 101st Rifle Division. It had been an intensive training for an opposed amphibious landing for more than six months. They would be accompanied by Marines and NKVD border troops. The landing force would be 10,000 strong. The main objective was Shumshu, the island closest to Kamchatka. Perpetual cloud prevented any effective Soviet air reconnaissance, but it was known that the Japanese had constructed a strong defensive line, including pillboxes and anti-tank traps, to protect the key naval base at Kataoka. At the island's northern tip, there were several bunkers and an anti-aircraft battery mounted on the Mariupol, a Soviet tanker stranded in 1943. The garrison of 8,500 men was commanded by Major General Fusaki. General Dyakov opted for a beach landing in the north. Dyakov thought that a direct assault on the port of Kataoka was too risky. But his land campaign carried its own risks. If the Japanese could bring in reinforcements from the neighboring island of Paramushir, General Fusaki would have 23,000 men, including 16 amphibious tanks, at his disposal. At 4 a.m. on the 17th of August, the invasion force of 42 ships set sail from Kamchatka in thick fog. It was a day-long voyage to Shumshur. Radio silence was enforced. Messages were sent only by signal lamp or semaphore. At 2 a.m. the next morning, the fleet arrived off the landing beach. The assault troops would have to contend with powerful currents and freezing water. The regular bombardment from the Cape Lopatka battery caused the Japanese to miss the landing of the Soviet advance guard. It was detected only an hour later, by which time they were more than a mile inland. The Japanese guns belatedly opened fire. Soviet naval guns set fire to the lighthouse, which acted as a beacon for the rest of the landing ships. The next wave was landed 200 meters from the shore. Hundreds were carried away by powerful currents, but enough men reached the beach to begin the assault. Heavy cloud cover meant there was no air support. They were on their own. But the light Japanese tanks proved vulnerable even to Soviet anti-tank rifles. Seven tanks were destroyed with anti-tank grenades. First Sergeant Babich distinguished himself by destroying two tanks single-handedly. It was a massacre. Only one Japanese tank escaped. The infantry moved forward to assault the enemy strongpoints, supported by artillery, which had now been landed at the beach. Within 24 hours, the Japanese opened negotiations. General Fusaki announced a ceasefire the following day, and on the morning of the 22nd of August, the garrison laid down its arms. The last battle of the Second World War had cost the lives of more than a 1,000 soldiers on both sides.
On the 25th of August, the garrison of Onokoten surrendered, followed by Matsua with its naval base and airfield. The rest of the Kuril Islands soon followed suit. Soviet forces were planning to occupy Hokkaido, the northernmost of the Japanese home islands. But the operation was cancelled by Stalin in the face of forthright opposition from the United States. But in line with the agreement signed at Yalta, the Soviet Union now took full possession of the former Japanese territories of South Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands. On the 2nd of September, 1945, the Japanese instrument of surrender was signed aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. It was signed on behalf of the Soviet Union by General Derivianko. The Soviet Union had earned its place at the ceremony by its decisive action in Manchuria, which proved a crushing blow to Japanese hopes of continued resistance. But the first hints of coolness had crept into relations between the wartime allies. They had already begun to form two distinct camps. And five years later, Soviet and American pilots would meet over Korea as enemies. But for now, the allies celebrated their victory. The largest war in history was at an end. The fighting had raged across three continents and four oceans. It had claimed the lives of an estimated 70 million people. But now, the soldiers were coming home. They believed that this war was the last, the very last. How could it be otherwise? <laughs>